Welcome one and all to yet another red hot, spicy, sizzling, moist, tender, succulent Kings of War tournament report. This time it's Swords of Summer. And to guide you through this experience, I'm going to pop into the corner of the screen right now. Hello there. I'm armed with all my vital documentation here, such as my army list. And we're going to go through all five of my games from this two-day event that took place right in the middle of Manchester at BritCon. Now, as you look at image one from game one, just a slight touch on the actual venue itself. It's very close to the middle of Manchester. The, the complex of buildings was easy enough to find, but to actually find my way into the tournament room was a little bit of a challenge. I think there was one sign somewhere around the entire perimeter of the entire complex that had the word BritCon on it somewhere, and it was just a tiny little A4 sheet of paper printed out and stuck on a wall. There wasn't really any kind of real signage to get in, so I know I wasn't alone in wandering around all these buildings trying to find my way in, and even the security people that were patrolling the area didn't seem to know what was going on. So I think they should invest in some signage for next year. Anyway. Here we go. So, oh, we've got Davy and Steve in the chat already. Hello there. Are you prepared to join me on this emotional and spicy red hot sizzling journey into the depths of my tactical mind so that you might pick up some serious tactical tips that you can take with you on your own Kings of War adventures? So as you can see from this picture, I've gone with the goblins. Now this tournament, the, the way that it's scored is pretty standard, the way many tournaments are scored now. So it's 5 points for a loss, 10 for a draw, 15 for a win, and then you can accumulate bonus points up to 5 based on how much of your opponent's army you kill, and then up to 5 based on how many victory points you gained in the scenario. That's capped at 5 though. And it's 2,600 points. This is a very, very hefty tournament size. This, this is, I think, the biggest one I've ever been to in terms of the point level. I've been to some that have escalated up towards that level, but never anything that was just consistently that high all the way through. So, let's go through my list, shall we? And, we'll come back to that image in a minute, but let's have a look here. So, on my deployment you can see that I've got quite a lot of trolls. You can see that there are flea bags. And as we whiz through, you can see it's very similar to what I had in the last battle report. And, let's go back to the wide shot now, and I'll just tell you everything in intimate detail that is in my list. Oh, it's Charlie, not Davy. Well, okay, so we have spitters, first of all. We have a regiment and a horde. I hadn't been taking these a lot recently. Uh, I've gone for more combat-themed armies, but this is kind of the ultimate. I feel at 2,600 points, you can go for a real killer goblin gun line and still have enough fighty units for when the enemy reach you. So we'll see if that works out. So a couple of units of spitters there. We've got the four troll hordes, which are pretty standard now in my lists. There's only two artifacts on them though. One has Dwarven Ale and one has Chalice of Wrath, which are my two go-to items for the very easily wavered trolls, the two items that most mitigate that. Then we've got two units of Fleabag Rider Sniffs, two regiments as usual, three War Trombones, pretty standard, three Rock Lobbers, because this is going to be quite a good line here. We've got a king on a flea bag, so I've not used him too much before, but he is quite handy with his five attacks and a bow, so hitting on fours as well. So he's just a little bit of extra shooting, a little bit of extra inspiring, and he can also do a bit of fighting as well if he needs to. Then we've got the flagget with, as standard, the Diadem of Dragonkind, which is my usual setup with him. We've got two wizards, one on foot with Critter's Call, which I think is going to be very useful in case I come up against something that has even more guns than I do. And also for disordering anything that might want to be flying and harassing me in that sort of way. Then we've got a second wizard. This one is mounted on a fleet bag with Blizzard and the Heart Seeking Chant. So it's a piercing Blizzard, which makes it very, very tasty. It makes him quite an expensive character, but in terms of all the different armies. Goblins have one of the cheaper ways to access the Piercing Blizzard. The Goblin Wiz is quite inexpensive compared to many other races' casters. So if he's only being used for that role, and he's keeping out of harm's way, then it doesn't matter the fact that he's maybe a little more squishy than certain other races' casters. Now he's not 
he's not as squishy as the Flaggit, which has always been strange to me. We've got a Troll Bruiser with the Blade of Slashing. We've got a Mincer. We've got Grogger's Goons. And we've got Grogger's Great Lobber. So we've got four Rock Lobbers, three Trombones. We've got the Diadem. We've got the two Wizards with ranged attacks. We've got the, uh, the Spitters, the Sniffs, the King. We've got all in all, I think, 15 shooting units and then seven close combat units. So that is quite a formidable attack. So the plan that I had in mind for this army initially was to make sure that I'm removing units all the time, pretty much, because at 2,600 points you're going to come up against armies that have a lot of drops. I've got 22, but I'm expecting some of the armies to be close to matching that. So not all of those drops are going to be good. So this, the trap that sometimes you fall into if you're taking a gun line is to uh, start focusing on something that's really tough, maybe. And a lot of the shooting isn't that reliable. The rock lobbers in particular, and even all the, the regular shots that are hitting on fives. So if you have a, a bit of a mediocre turn, sometimes you might have not killed anything if you focus on something that's really, really tough to take out, like defense six units, for example, or things that are in cover. So what I'm going to try to do is pick on things that I know I can kill. Blizzard is really handy for that because it doesn't suffer any kind of hindrances and it can just, it's, it's not quite guaranteed, but it's a high chance of doing a small to medium amount of damage. That's so perfect for taking out things like enemy characters, uh, lower level ones, and war machines, for instance. So focusing fire on weak to medium units initially, unless there's something that's a real threat that I need to put wounds on and maybe waver. So, oh, Raphael and Stu are in the chat as well. Hello there. So, you can see the army up against me here is Kingdoms of Men. And one thing I, I knew it was possible that I could face something that's even more of a gun line than my army. And I think that's exactly what we've got. So, this is going to be the control scenario initially. And of course, that means that you want to control each of the six two by two squares on the table, especially the one at the centre in your opponent's half. That one's worth extra an extra point to you. So let's go through my deployment here. So on this flank, I've, you can see I've positioned the rock lobbers, two of them in the corner there, uh, because there's a hill in the middle and there's those woods and there's another hill in the, in the top right. So the firing lanes are slightly limited. So I just want to give myself a, a good as good an angle as possible. So anything that's over on the left hand side can be targeted by those lobbers and anything that comes beyond the hill as well. I've got two troll hordes there with the mincer. There's the king next to them and another troll horde backed up by a trombone and one of the sniff units there. Then there's the bruiser and the other trolls. So we've got all the trolls over on this side. We've got the flagget. We've got Grogger's goons with some more trombones and the two wizards behind them. We've got the spitters there. We've got the sniffs. We've got more lobbers in this corner. They don't have quite as much cover to worry about there. There's just that piece of difficult terrain. And then we've got the Spitter Regiment all the way over there on the right. So onto my opponent's army. Now, this is, as I look at it, this is the right flank. So I've got a copy of the list here. So these are knights, and there are three units of knights in total. This is the first one. One of them has the Orcish Skull Pole. Well, that's only a minor item, so I don't think it really matters if I don't remember which unit had that. In front of them, I believe that is a Regiment of Pole Arms. So they have a bit of crushing strength, just regular infantry, really. And then along from there, we have some... Now, I'm probably going to butcher this pronunciation. How's it pronounced? Arquebusiers, something along those lines. They're pretty much your musketeers, kind of. So let's just call them that. And there's another unit of them there, behind the wall. And Well, that's actually a wall that's part of their base. These ones have Jar of the Four Winds, so they have extra range. So piercing two units... Piercing two shots, and with 36 inch range on these ones, they are actually something that's a big threat to the likes of my trolls, for example. And they can be quite tasty. There are three ballistas around there as well. And let's have a look here, the ballistas. So, uh, unlike certain other armies, bolt thrower type units, they only have one attack. And it's D3 plus two hits when it does hit, with piercing three, so it's actually quite tasty. So then we've got a spear phalanx, I believe that would be there. 
so phalanx, I don't have too much thunderous charge, so I'm not overly concerned about that. Then there's a mortar and three cannons, plus a hero hanging out with them as well, with the boomstick. And there is the formation that makes the cannons elite when the hero is hanging around with them. So that is quite a ranged little battery we've got there. Then we have a, a horde of pole arms, so the crushing strength infantry, two more of the knight units, and the character that's chasing along behind them, I think, is a captain on a horse. So if we go back, there should be a wizard somewhere as well. Okay, yeah, there are three wizards in front of those spearmen there. I think all of them are wizards. One of them has blizzard, one of them has a teleport, and one of them has guiding light. So guiding light can be uh, very useful. Let's see. So that would affect anything, any war machines that have the reload or the indirect fire rules. That would be all these war machines, all seven long range war machines that my opponent has put up against me here. So the advantages I would expect to normally have in this tournament, I am lacking here because I think my opponent could potentially outgun me, especially at range. More of my shooting is short range. So we'll see how it goes. First turn, if I could get first turn and maybe kill off a couple of those war machines early, that would be a big help, but we'll see how it goes. There's also a special piece of terrain on every table, and in this one, I believe this skull pile, anyone who sets up, or anyone who um, has part of their base within a certain number of inches, in fact, we can see that if we move me out of the way, partially within five inches of this base, then they lower their defense to minus one, I think. So... You don't want to be hanging around those skulls. So my opponent gets the first turn, unfortunately. And that's potentially bad news if I start losing units to artillery. And you can see the knights are pushing up there. And in the middle, there's not going to be too much of an advance because, like I said, a lot of my shooting is short range, whereas my opponent has a lot of long range. So there's no incentive for him to push forward this early. Everything moving forward a little bit, apart from the shooty units, though. And over on this side, you can see the knights with that unit of pole arms shielding them from uh, any kind of unhindered fire. And all the wizards are just ducking into the woods. And what does this shooting barrage do? You can see that's live dice rolling action there. A picture of a dice in motion. What a rarity. What a treat, in fact. So what does the shooting accomplish? Well, we've got eight wounds on the spitter horde already. The cannons. Now I can confirm that in turn one, all three of the cannons hit. And that's nine wounds on a troll horde. And this is actually the next cannon that hits as well. So look at that. 14 wounds on the troll horde, and they are dead. I'm not sure if all three hit the trolls, but at least two of them targeted the trolls. I'm not sure all of them could see them. One of them may have targeted a different unit, but all three of the cannons definitely hit in the first turn. One of them hit with the assistance of Elite from the hero standing right next to them, but that's one troll horde down instantly. So that's not the best start. So looking at this now, what kind of plan of action have I got? Well, I'm gonna to have to shoot at the soft targets to stop them shooting me, things like cannons, I'm gonna try and take them out where possible. I may have to focus fire on the ranged hordes if I want to take them down. So that's going to be more difficult. Anything with low defense and high nerve is not ideal for rock lobbers, so I'm more likely going to be directing the weaker shooting attacks at them. And really push everything forward and try and get into a fight, uh, which isn't going to be that easy either, because those, those knights are going to outspeed most of my units. So it's looking tricky, but we'll see what I've got up my sleeve. So moving forward a bit with some of these units, uh, most of these are already in range to shoot though and we've started plinking some damage onto this infantry that are screening the knights and i do focus quite a bit of fire into these guys into these musketeers on the hill and quite a bit of damage on them the trolls are pushing up and the grogger's goons all the combat units really are just flying up there as fast as possible because in the center and that's really where my opponent doesn't have any fighter units. There's just that one infantry horde there. So if I can uh, push units in there, I feel like I would have superiority there. My wizard, what does he do? Well, he kills a cannon with Blizzard instantly. So 
There you go. Boom. And I think that it's a very points effective use of the wizard with the blizzard. Because if he keeps doing that, and even if he kills something every other turn, he's way more than paying for himself over the course of the game. Over on this side is where I, I'm trying to use my first bits of tactics and movement. Uh, not exactly shenanigans. But I've put this king right in front of that unit. They charged them, in fact, did a bit of damage just to take away their thunderous charge for when they attack back. And I've put the trolls far enough back so that the knights would have to overrun six inches, I think, to get to them. So it's leaving the little bit of temptation there. And the other knight unit I've left alone, but you can see there's a unit of trolls that I've parked out in front of them because I don't really want anyone to charge the trolls on the left. What I want is for my opponent to charge those knights into uh, the trolls that I've got right in the middle of this little bundle here. Because even if they kill them in one round, whichever way they turn, they're going to be flank charged by either the mincer or the troll bruiser, who is looking in the other direction. So if, if you were to charge the trolls on the left and kill them, then there's potential that he could overrun and only be charged by the mincer, uh, possibly in the front. So it would be possible to avoid those trolls that are there. So I'm hoping he charges into that unit in the middle there. Of course, if he, it's not a guarantee that he kill trolls in one go. So charging into the trolls on the left, you could argue, is a bigger risk because being charged by trolls in the flank is just an immediate death sentence for knights. So we'll see. And there's how that side's looking much less of an advance from me there because there's uh, on the right anyway because that's where a lot of my ranged units are piling straight through the middle because those enemy guns i can't leave them alone for too long and i think i also used critter's call on those muskets on the hill as well with the wizard so using it up just to deny them the ability to shoot at the goons a bit this turn if that's indeed gonna, would have been their target anyway Turn two. So, of course, the knights into the king and the other knights into these trolls. Obviously, my opponent weighed up and decided that those trolls were the safer option, rather than risk being flanked by a full horde of trolls. As if, for example, I had my trolls on the left further back, that would have meant that he could have charged them and overrun even a tiny amount to guarantee that the trolls on the right wouldn't have seen them. So you have to weigh up these things. Putting the trolls on the left there in range of potentially being overrun on the roll of a six past the king, but any further back, then it becomes tricky to get those trolls at the, at the correct angle to be able to see them. And here you can see that Bruiser is just menacingly looking into that flank there. So unless they get the kill, they are going to get absolutely mushed. And you can see the pole arms have gone up into the forest, and there's lots of deforestation going on here. Trees were annoying to quite a lot of people. You can see they're resting on top of the units there. I find that trees, even though they always look cool, even the ones I've made, they are annoying uh, because they do tend to fall over when you don't put them back in the holes, and then when you take them out the holes, if you move them all off to the side, sometimes you can forget that it's actually a forest. And you can just treat it as terrain and line something up for line of sight, and then remember, oh yeah, that's actually a forest, we just took all the trees out. So you have to be wary of that. And you can see what's going on in the middle there. The hero's just positioned himself so that he's granting elite to all those cannons there. And over on that side, there's some shooting going on. What's going to be damaged this time? So the Spitter Horde have taken more wounds, and the Snips there have been shot as well. Not enough to kill them yet. And what about the cannons, and the mortar, and the wizards, and the lightning bolt? Well, oh, the suspense. Three damage onto the flagget. Four damage onto these trolls on the hill and wavers them, and these are not trolls that have any kind of way to counteract that, so they're going to be stuck there for a turn, which is annoying. King gets wavered in combat, uh, which is okay with me, holding those knights up for a bit longer. 
which is what he was supposed to be doing anyway. Uh, the trolls do get killed in one shot by the knights though, 10 damage, and they position themselves like so, and they accept that they're going to be flanked by, uh, I can't remember which one they leave in the flank, either the mincer or the bruiser. I think maybe it's the bruiser that's in the flank there. It's difficult to tell, but one of them was in, it was impossible to get both of them in the front, so my opponent had to choose which one. So, turn two for the goblins. And there's a little bit of reshuffling going on here, not much, just so the sniffs can see the unit there on the right. And what I really want to do is put enough wounds into those that polearm regiment that are just off camera up at the top in the middle there. I want to put enough wounds on them to waver them, ideally. That would be the perfect roll, because then the knights would be trapped behind them. If I kill them, then the knights could then charge out and attack those spitters there and get right into my lines. So I just want to waver them. So we'll see whether I can. Uh, or was, was that last turn I tried to do that? Well, it seems like they've gone anyway. I may have killed them this turn while trying to waver, but I think I actually waver these knights, possibly. With lots of shooting. They do have headstrong, though. Be sure the knights have headstrong anyway. So the war trombones, what do they do? Well, they clear out one of the wizards who was up there. And I think the one who parked himself out in the open actually may have had... Let me just check this. Okay. So, yeah, the one that had Guiding Light actually had the Crystal Pendant of Retribution as well, so I didn't want to charge him with the goons. So I moved the goons around him and then tromboned him off. And you can see that also I've taken out the muskets on the hill now. They were heavily damaged before, and now they're toast. So it was the bruiser in the flank, and they let the mincer have the front. It's debatable what, which is better to be charged in the flank by a mincer or a bruiser. Uh, the mincer potentially has a lot more attacks, but it could just roll low and not have that many attacks more. And the bruiser is much more reliable at doing damage than the mincer. So it's I'm not sure how it maths out exactly. You can see that lots of damage is done, but I don't kill the knights with those charges. I would have certainly been hoping to. You would expect the bruiser to do maybe 7 or 8 damage on his own. And then whatever the mincer can chip in with, you would hope that would be enough to kill them there. But alas, no. And you can see on the hill those wavered trolls are just turning around a bit, making sure they're not in charge range of the polearm horde in the woods. And the sniffs have moved onto the hill so they can shoot over it. So there's that situation. My king moved out of the way, being wavered there, you can see, and allowed the trolls to charge through straight to the front of those other knights that were already a teensy bit damaged from the king previously, and troll them to death. They are dead. And some shooting damage onto these guys in the woods. But sometimes you just don't have any other targets, so you have to shoot at units in cover. And what do these guys do? Well, shoot up one of the cannons. There's quite a bit of damage there, and I think that may have become wavered, possibly, that cannon. So, whittling down at the enemy, slowly. Turn three. And these knights that were freed up by my killing of their infantry screen, uh, I think they were wavered, but passed their headstrong roll. In fact, they've got the list right here, let's see if they do have headstrong. Yes, they do. All the knights have headstrong. So they decide to charge into the sniffs. Uh, which is getting them in range of my rock lobbers as well, so I'm not going to be able to shoot at them with those, and I'm going to have to turn around any units that want to shoot at them, which will mean the spitters are then hitting on sixes, which is not ideal. The bruiser, as a result of the failure to break those knights, is now getting charged in the rear in the kind of hideous bruiser sandwich, with the knights countercharging into the front. Uh, the enemy mounted hero there is attacking my mounted king, and you can see where I put the goons earlier. And they are to get out of the way of that crystal pendant wielding wizard. That was the only direction I could thrust them in. And there's going to be some serious shooting going on in a moment. The wizards are just spreading out a bit in front of that uh, phalanx horde. So what do the wizards get up to? I think the blizzard one is still alive. So this one manages to get a flank on the mincer and do a bit of damage there. And these muskets with the extra range. Get those trolls up to 8 damage now, the ones on the hill, 
and kill them. So wavered them the first time, killed the second time. And my water and bone there has taken some damage as well. The king gets wavered again. And this is actually a really annoying spot to be wavered in because despite being nimble, the proximity of the enemy units means that he's not going to be able to get out of the way there. Because he can't even use a pivot to move backwards out of the way because that would bring him within an inch of an enemy unit. So the trolls would have to move before he can move out of the way. And he would want to move out of the way so the trolls could possibly charge the flank of the knights. But we'll see. We've got other options there. So the bruiser is dead, which is expected. But those knights are so close to death, one little bit of tromboneage to them is going to take them out easily. And there's how that situation is looking. They turn around to face the imminent threat. I'm going to have the option of looking for an overrun with the trolls on that hero. So these knights kill off the sniffs on the right flank, which is expected as well. And then they turn to face that way, making sure that they're not going to get charged in the rear by spitters, which isn't that much of a threat anyway, really. And there's how the battlefield looks. So I've lost quite a lot of units, but this is control, remember. And my enemy doesn't have that many scoring units left. Let's see, how many have I got? I've got trolls up at the top, I've got sniffs on the hill, and then I've got my goons, which is three. I've got my spitter horde and my spitter regiment, so I've got five scoring units left. My opponent has the two at the top there, the knights and the horde, two more hordes. So my opponent may only have four scoring units left. So in terms of the scenario, it's not looking that unhealthy, actually. Turn three for me. So... The knights are dead. I turn round both my shooter units, hitting them on sixes. You can see that my wizard has moved into range as well in the top left there, and he uses his lightning bolt on them, and they are toast. They're already quite damaged. And over here, my little shooting battery I've got set up here with my blizzard and my sniffs. What do they do? Well, we delete another cannon and wound another. The trolls put some damage onto the enemy hero here but can't kill him and get an overrun, unfortunately. War Trombone uh, kills off somebody. Let's see who that would have been. If we wind back. That was probably one of the enemy heroes. I would, or actually, it may be... Let's see, did I manage to kill that big giant horde of infantry? No, oh, they're still there. So I think it was a hero that was killed off. And there's how it looks at the end of that turn. So the goons are... They're getting closer. They're getting into range to do something. Let's see where I had the old goons last time. So at the end of the previous turn... Right, there they are. So they've moved up and they had to turn inwards a little bit, I think. Either that or did they just move 10 directly forwards? Let's see. Get to this image. Okay, I think they did turn. So what they want to do is get in a position where they can charge that big horde next turn, which they have done now. So that horde now can't move and shoot, so they're going to have to kill the goons who are undamaged in one round or face a charge and possible death. Turn four for the enemy. So this shooting battery of ballistas and muskets, what do they do? 11 damage onto the goons, which means that they need a roll of 10 on the nerve to remove them. Over here, we've lost the sniffs on the hill. And look at that. That is the goons. 11 damage. They are dead. So 10 or more to kill them, and that was what was rolled. So very unlucky there for the goons, because if you look at what position they were in, they were about to charge a critical enemy unit if they'd survived one round and you would certainly hope that they could do that, but alas, no one inspiring nearby, so they are dead. Over here, I think a, I think the king gets killed over here, and the trolls are being charged by that horde, and take a bit of damage there, but they're not concerned yet. And there's the enemy hero, who I think takes out a trombone, probably. So, it's not looking too healthy now. I've still got some scoring units. We've got three each, I think, at this point. And I've got quite a lot of little shooting attacks, as does my opponent, though. 
But the cannon and the mortar are almost out of the game at the moment. There's nothing for them to really target. So let's see. Turn 4 for me. The war trombones move up. Start putting damage onto that horde, because they're going to be critical for scoring point. Trolls counter charge into this horde and do quite a bit of damage as well. I think the red ones represent 5, probably. And over here, you can see that my spitter horde have turned round so they can shoot at something. And I'm keeping the spitter regiment hidden over there, trying to keep them out of sight and range of enemy shooting so that they can definitely survive and get me a point. And still just shooting up the enemy to not that much effect. And now it says four, but I think this might actually be enemy turn five here. So. You can see double charge from the mounted hero and the pole arm horde into the trolls. The phalanx horde charge into one of the war trombones as they make their way towards my central area where they're hoping to score. And the muskets and the blisters, they finish off the spitter horde unfortunately. So that's another scoring unit down. And what happens over here? We've got a cannon, we've got a lightning bolt. A little bit of damage onto the wizard, but they don't kill him. My troll horde is dead as well now, so I'm down to a single scoring unit. So at this point, I'm really looking for a draw, probably. Best. Since that troll horde is dead, and the trombone goes down as well, as expected there. So, I need to kill. There's two heavily, or two or more heavily wounded hordes here. So if I can just kill a couple of those, then I should be alright. Look at all the damage on that one. Turn 5 for the goblins, so rocks and blizzard, what do they do? Well, we kill off the big horde in the middle, the horde of phalanx horde there with the trombone also chipping in. My other rocks, they land more damage onto the whole arm horde, so very close to killing them. We've got another turn to try and kill them as well. And I think this is onto my opponent's turn now, without a picture of a turn dice, how sloppy there. Say, Charlie says, you play scenario so well, is that more list or play, would you say, or equally as important? Um, if you mean, am I thinking about the scenario, or have I built lists that are good at scenarios? I would say, my list, in terms of the number of drops I have, quite a lot of them aren't scoring, so maybe you could make a, a better list for scenario play. Uh, but I'm always consciously aware of what the scenario is. And I'm keeping an eye on which units I've got left alive and where they need to be in order to score, especially in the last three turns, I would say. At the start, just focusing on killing the things that are a threat, because obviously if my army gets wiped out, then I can't win the scenario anyway. So try and win the fight in the first three turns and win the war in the last three or four turns, I would say, is a decent way of going about it. So this is my opponent's turn now, and the other trombone gets toasted there. And everything else is just chilling out. There's not much for them to do. So I've got one turn left. I've got... That trombone down there is dead, by the way. I've got a wizard with lightning bolt. I've got a blizzard wizard. And I've got all my rock robbers. All I need to do is kill one of those hordes to get a draw. Because my opponent cannot reach to target my spitter regiment at the moment. If it goes for another turn... They may be able to because those ballistas on the right there have moved up onto the hill. And you can see my spitter, whore, spitter regiment there just hiding, scoring me a point at the moment. So turn six for me. Rock lobbers. Rock lobbers. One of them needs to hit. And they all miss. So there's a nice picture of the beautiful carpet there. And the blizzard wizard also targeted that horde that only needed one point of damage on them almost to put them in double one territory, I think, over on the left. But unfortunately, both the shots with Blizzard missed as well. So we're relying on the Lightning Bolt Wizard now to try and kill off the other horde, and all his Lightning Bolts missed as well. So all those shooting attacks, zero hits in that turn. And that's the end of the game. We do not get a turn seven. I really needed a turn seven because all it would have taken is one more damage me to kill that unit in the top left. They are so close to death at this point. 
And the, the musket horde would have been tougher to crack because they've not taken quite as much damage, but I've still got multiple rock lobbers and a lightning bolt wizard right there. The lightning bolt wizard who is in cover and individual, so they might not be able to shoot him off. So very unfortunate there, but alas. Could have been a draw quite easily, but it's a loss. But I do pick up quite a few points for killing most of my opponent's army and for scoring a victory point in the scenario as well. So, on to round two. And let's see, do I have a copy of this list? I don't think so, but this one isn't particularly complicated. I think I can tell you what everything is here. So this scenario, I believe uh, this one is, is it plunder? I think it's called, where you have five objectives across the center of the table that you can pick up and you each nominate one that's worth two. So you can see that there are two blue tokens on the middle of the table and three green ones. And the ones that are blue are worth two. So I'm up against the herd in this game. And let's go through the deployment, shall we? So on this flank, I've got the mincer. I've got the king backing up my two regiments of sniffs there. I find he's a good uh, combo for them, keeping them inspired because they are a bit chaffy, shall we say, so they can be shot down potentially. He keeps them inspired and he can chip in with his pretty decent shooting and defend them if a unit comes in wanting to charge them. He can then charge the unit and keep them alive a bit longer. We've got Troll Bruiser and a couple of Troll Hordes there behind the woods. We've got the Grogger's Goons backed up by three Trombones. So anything that breaks through there is just going to get a, a toasty welcome, shall we say. We've also got the wizard behind there with the blizzard. We've got some of my rot lobbers. The great lobber is the big ball, by the way, if I didn't mention that yet, if that's not obvious enough. We've got the flagget and the other wizard behind the spitter regiment there. The spitter horde as well. And two more hordes of trolls. And there's the other lobber. So, on my opponent's army, you can see there's a vanguard move there. There are there's some beast packs. That's behind the unit that have vanguarded forward. I think the ones that have gone forward do have ranged attacks, which is why I've hidden some of my vulnerable units. And uh, the, the regular infantry unit there in the top right, I can't remember exactly what they're called for the herd, but they're pretty standard. There are lots of hordes of guardian brutes here. There are three hordes there, which are the Minotaur model. There's also a guardian brute is it chieftain. He is at the back there. There are two beast packs behind them. There's a bit of chaff. There is a shaman of some description. There's some more regular infantry at the front on the right. And also there's a horde on the left of that, which is right here. There are two hordes there. And there is a hero on chariot. And right out there, there's another one on a chariot. So there's not too much in terms of how spread out this army is. It's all in kind of a big blob in the center. It's just a big, scary blob of meat, basically. And the chariots are going to be a bit of a threat. But one thing I like about this is the height of this army it means that I'm going to be able to target units over the top of my own goblins a lot. Because there's a lot of height two and three in this army, if you look at the chariots and the guardian brutes. So, this is the vanguard unit, and you can see where the, all the objectives are here. Spread out quite evenly. And I would have liked to have put the two uh, two-point objectives really far apart, because I, my opponent's army doesn't have that much speed in it. It's only got the, the chariots and the beast packs, really. It doesn't have any kind of units that could camp somewhere, get there rapidly, and then camp at both ends of the table. It's only that one vanguard unit, which are going to be completely obliterated by my shooting anyway. So my sniff units would have liked to have two really far apart uh, two-point objectives that they could go and collect and just sit there and just blink shots off at the enemy. But I had to pick the first one, unfortunately, so my opponent was able to select the one next to it. So turn one, and I've got turn one here. So I've gone first and moved forward. The mincer can see over that hill, being height three, I've just put it in such a way that it can start moving towards and picking up, pick up that token as well. 
and I've got all my little shooting battery there. The units are staying in cover and they're going to be shooting at the enemy from there. Trolls moving forward. Everything moving forward pretty rapidly considering I'm up against a heavy combat army, but you can see that that unit of uh, vanguard troops has been annihilated instantly by all my shooting, which is pretty much what you'd expect. And the other trolls over there on the right have pushed up as well. All the fighter units up as fast as they can. So yeah, down with that little unit. And all this shooting from the sniffs and the king, they move up so that they can shoot the chariot. And they waver one of them, which is nice. The rock lobbers, what do they do? Well, they start plinking a bit of damage onto these guardian brutes. I think it's three wounds that's done there. That's what it looks like. So that's the end of that turn. We've wavered a chariot, taken out the vanguard troops, put some damage onto the guardian brutes, and also getting first turn in this scenario could be important because I can get up and start picking up objectives as well. Turn one for the enemy. Now, you would think maybe there'd be a little bit of a standoff. You don't want to get charged by trolls after all, but no. Straight in there thinking, if I'm going to be charged by trolls, let's make it early and hindered because they're in the woods at the moment. So let's just thrust the entire meat of this herd force right into the goblins' faces. So you can see that that beast pack are blocking off the trolls from attacking some of the more vital units there. And everything else is just pushing up, apart from that unit in the top right. And I think they're just biding their time, waiting for the trolls to get out of the way before they head for that objective, possibly. So this hero on chariot Weaver's one of the sniff regiments with one wound, so a good nerve roll there. And there's how it looks in the middle. So this is the wall of meat that I'm going to have to approach very carefully here because there are so many guardian brutes that are just absolute killers. There are those two big infantry hordes, and there's plenty of chaff in there as well. So what am I going to do about this? So the troll bruiser that you can see in the bottom left, in the middle of the two troll hordes, he's nimble. So he's going to be able to charge a lot of those units there if he wants to. And he's most likely going to pick to combo charge the Guardian Brutes on the left. So of the three Manitor units, the leftmost. And combo charge them with Grogger's Goons, probably. And then that would allow my Trolls to go for the units that are on the left-hand side here. And then I'll shoot everything on the right-hand side, because that's where all my shooting is. And the Trombones and the Diadem are right there as well. So that's going to be my plan. So my trolls move into position there a little bit. On the this is on my right flank. These trolls aren't. They're not really part of the game at the moment. They're not part of my main battle line. So these two, you could argue they're more expendable, but there are some valuable objectives around there as well. So I do that double charge that I mentioned with the bruiser and the goons, onto those guardian brutes and put quite a bit of damage on them. You can see they've picked up an objective as well. That's a two-pointer as well. But I have not taken them out yet. Still alive. All my shooting attacks. Look at all those trombones. And they kill off the unit of Guardian Brutes next to that one. So that's a success. And put six damage onto those guys at the front there as well. And the Guardian Brutes at the back have taken some damage. Now I don't think they have any kind of regeneration in this army. And you can see that these trolls picked up one of the tokens en route to charging into that big horde there. Put some wounds on them. And these trolls went into the beast pack. But because both these units were hindered, I wasn't expecting necessarily to kill. But the beast pack had become wavered. The sniffs that weren't wavered, what do they accomplish? Well, they plink more damage onto a chariot. Oh, this is a different chariot this time. The mincer goes and picks up that token, and I think the mincer could be charged by that chariot potentially at the moment. Uh, but it would be in the front, so I'm not worried about that at this stage. And you can see my king has pushed up a bit as well there, to do some shooting goodness. So we're kind of closing in, but it's difficult to encircle because there are threats on both flanks potentially. So it might look like there's a bit of encirclement going on, but it's not that much. So, 
double charge from the chariot hero and these infantry. We actually reposition those units in a second to make the the distribution of the facing more even. I think it was slightly wrong when I took this picture. And then we we actually checked with a couple of people as well just to make sure that we set it up correctly after this because it was potentially important for setting up flanks and so on. And the final unit of Guardian Brutes that haven't been fighting anyone yet, they attack the goons along with that unit in the flank there, which is okay. They may well die. These Guardian Brutes charge into the trolls, actually. That was the unit that were heavily damaged. This is the one that were not fighting yet. So these were the ones that were at the back taking a small amount of damage. These ones, those have got 8 damage on them, these ones have got 3. So that's my Dwarven Ale troll unit though, so I'm not too worried there. I think they're, on average, they should probably waver them with an attack, but they could kill them, definitely. And you can see a Guardian Brute Chieftain there has moved in for the kill, so I may be losing out on this flank, but I've got a lot of shooting here, so if I can just get these units up in this little war of attrition here, just get their damage quite high, then I can shoot them off later. And there's how that's looking. On this left flank, the Mincer are in a bit of a stare down with that chariot. And in the center, that we reposition those units there, you can see on the left, so they're sharing the frontage a bit more equally. And because of that, that allows the beast pack to charge through there into the bruiser, just about. So there's how all the charges are set up, and let's see who kills who. So, oh yeah, there's a bit of healing going on here. I think this shaman takes some wounds off those guardian brutes. And that one joins in as well, so they're almost back to full health now. Which is very tasty. And I think that dice represents Bane Chant on the big horde of infantry there. And those trolls that with they did have the Dwarven Ale, but it doesn't matter because they just got killed in one go. So a very good performance from those brutes. Uh, the Grogus Goon Horde are killed. And that was expected. But now look at this wall of flaming death that they've got to deal with. The trombones and the diadem and all my other shooting units just waiting for this to happen. So they can just torch anyone that breaks through. The bruiser takes one damage, but he doesn't care about that. And that troll horde are killed with that double charge as well. So I've lost a lot of my trolls now. So I'm going to have to shoot some of these damaged units off. That's how it's looking. And it's not looking too healthy in terms of numbers of units, but once you punch through my battle line of trolls, you then have to deal with that aforementioned wall of arrows and toasty goodness that's going to greet you. So we'll see what's actually left at the end of next turn. Turn three for the goblins. So the other trolls on the right try and take some revenge for their fallen brethren there. The other option here would have been to just sit in the woods and let them charge. And against some armies that would have been okay because they would be hindered, but I'm pretty sure all these units have, all these herd units have Pathfinder, so it wouldn't have helped. Trombones reposition themselves so they can toast everybody in sight and all the archers and the blizzard and the diadem of dragonkind and the rock lobbers. And with all that, they take out just a huge amount of enemy units. And that whole center is just pretty much clear of units now. They just blast everything to death. And the bruiser does a teensy bit of damage onto those that beast pack unit there. Uh, the sniffs move into the woods and shoot the other beast pack, but double one them on a zillion damage. Wow, wow, wow. The king wavers this chariot by getting into its flank and then shooting it with his bow. The other king takes some sniff damage, I think. And the other trolls here charge in to that big infantry horde, put more damage on them, who are carrying a token, by the way, which they stole off my trolls, I think. So look at the middle now, it's looking much more healthy all of a sudden. It was looking really terrible, but then, as I said, as soon as my zillion shooting units have a go, as long as the rocks actually hit occasionally, 
if they hit just an average amount of times and back up all the other things that are going to hit a lot more regularly, then units just die as soon as they punch through the battle line. So it's still wide open this game. There are most of the tokens are still on the ground, I think. And I feel like the turn dice may be incorrect here. Let's just check what was the last one. Okay, that said turn three, and it was my turn. Uh, that might be right, actually. I, I did go first. So yeah, that could be correct. So turn three for the herd. We've got all the guardian brutage into that troll horde, so it could quite easily kill them. And the other unit there are poised on the flank to go and take that token in a minute. In the centre, the the big horde there charge into the trolls with the counter charge, but they do that before the chariot moves backwards, which is why they haven't slid along. And then the chariot moves out the way because it's hindered. The beast pack back into the bruiser. The hero on chariot up there. Wounds the sniffs in cover again. And the other sniffs take a charge from the beast pack that were double wand. And the troll horde on the right flank is dead, as anticipated. And they just turn to face rather menacingly my gun line. But again, my opponent hasn't managed to really take out any of my shooting yet. So they're just going to be greeted with toasty goodness. The trolls with the Chalice of Wrath here get wavered, which is fine because they have Fury, so they're going to be able to counter charge and hopefully finish off that unit next. And it's still in the balance, but I think the massed amount of shooting units I've got alive puts it slightly in my favour at the moment. Turn four for the goblins. So you can see the Guardian Brutes are toast. They are shot off the table by all that terrible shooty goodness. And the Chieftain is just chilling out on one damage on his own. The unit over on this side as well gets shot off. So I think that was by the... You can see how the Spitters have got their toe dipped into the woods. They can actually see through those woods. And I think they were able to shoot them. They're also dead. In the middle, the War Bones do some business as well. I think they kill off an enemy character. And the Trolls that were fighting that big horde, kill them, so there's just one more horde behind them. And the king finishes shooting up that chariot and kills it. And the other chariot up there looks like it's been wavered again as a result of my sniff shooting. So it's just repeatedly been wavered throughout this game. And these sniffs counter charge into the beast pack and finish them off. Only needed to do one damage to get them into double one town again. Are dead. And it's looking much more healthy all of a sudden. And really, what can my opponent do here? It's got to get objectives, but it's hard to do that while killing off my units, and all those war trombones are just causing havoc. But there, there aren't enough enemy units left to kill them. When you leave it this late into the game, and you haven't killed any of the enemy shooting units, and you're running low on units yourself, it's very, very difficult to prioritise. You have to think of the scenario, which units can pick up tokens, but which units can kill all of your units. So, turn four for the herd, and the chieftain goes to pick up a token. This big horde here charge into the trolls. Uh, this is the first time they've seen combat, I think, this horde. They were hiding behind the other horde the whole time. And they don't do too much to those trolls, so they're going to get flanked by a bruiser by the looks of things. And this guy attacks, I think the shaman attacks a war trombone. <laughs> And you can see that that troll horde are killed. So another unit I can't pick up a token with. And that's how they turn to face at the end there, with the token that they picked up there. So at this point in the game, with a couple of turns left, my opponent has two units that can hold tokens, I think. Actually, he's still got the chariot that keeps being wavered, but that's so far away from the action, it's difficult. Dicey guy says troll feast. Yes, it was a troll feast. Lots of trolls were eaten. I don't have any of my troll hordes left, but the bruiser is still alive. So, I'm going to try to shoot off the guardian brute chieftain in the top right of the screen there. And if I do that, then I'm quite confident because I'm holding a token with the mincer. 
and I'm going to be able to pick up others. I've got so many units to block up that big horde with, I don't think they're going to be able to get to the... Those really valuable two-point objectives are still sitting there in the middle of the table, those blue ones. So I'm going to have to use my archers to go and try and pick one of those up. Turn five for the goblins. So you can see the Spitter regiment have moved forward. Not worrying about shooting at the moment. They need to go and get a token ASAP. And what does my shooting accomplish with the lobbers and the spitters and the lightning bolt? Well, the Guardian Brute Chieftain is dead. And so is the enemy hero that was chilling out there as well. The sniffs that have been in cover shooting at that chariot all game, they actually kill it this time. So the enemy only have this one unit left. And what I've done here, I've charged it with multiple units so that it can't turn round. I've charged it, put the king into the rear, the sniffs and the bruiser into the front. And that means they're not going to be able to turn and go towards any of the tokens now. They can still get closer to them via countercharging the bruiser, but they can't actually turn and over on anything and start heading in that direction. So it's looking quite healthy at the moment. And you can see my Spitter Regiment that moved up. There is a, a very valuable token there behind the trombones at the top of the screen. And there's another one to the left of the trombones, which the Bruiser is eyeing up if he can survive. He can go and pick that up. And the Mincer is definitely going to survive with the token now because there's nothing over there to threaten it whatsoever. On the bottom left there. Turn 5 for the Herd. So he does counter charge the Bruiser as expected to get closer to those tokens. And they only waver him though, so they are stuck in that position and it's gonna be very, very difficult for them to pick up anything now. Turn six. So the Spitter Regiment get onto the two-point objective as the trombones dive out the way. And my shooting attacks from the wizard and the diadem on the flagget plink some wounds onto that hero. And plenty of sniff assault onto this horde, and the king attacks them again. Start piling up the damage on them. Turn six for the herd. So they counter charge the sniffs on the left there. And they pretty much just have to kill things at this stage because they're not going to win the scenario or get to any more objectives. And they do kill them, so there's some more kill points. And there's how that looks at the end of that situation. We do get turn seven. This is good for me because I'm going to be able to pick up more victory points. And at the end of this turn, I had six seconds left. So um, I was finding in this tournament, even though you get one hour, 10 minutes at 2,600 points, because I had 22 drops and so many of them are shooting and I was having to position everything to prevent the war machines and the individuals being attacked so much. I was using up a lot of time. I was very, very close to the end of the clock here. So you can see that the bruiser just goes towards that two point objective and picks it up. And everyone else just murders the horde, and finishes them off. So they are dead. And there's that one hero left alive down there at the bottom left. Uh, so there's the dead horde. Turn seven for my opponent. There's not really much he can do just move that one hero around, try and kill something, which I don't think succeeds. And that is going to be that. So that's the end of the game. And I've got maximum points there because I've killed all but one model. And that one model wasn't enough to deprive me of maximum kill points. I've got maximum victory points because I've got five. I've got the two two point objectives with the bruiser and the spitters there. And the mincer is still carrying a one point objective. So maximum points. It's a nice way to bounce back from the, the slight misfortune, I think, in round one that prevented me snatching a draw from that one. And into round three. So this is the final game of day one. And then the final two games will be on day two. So this one is against Abyssal Dwarves, which is very interesting to me. I'm paying extra close attention every time I face Abyssal Dwarves recently because, as you may have seen, they are going to be my next army. I've got one complete unit so far. There's a little video I put up yesterday on that. I want to see them. There's also pictures on various Facebook outlets as well and on Twitter. 
So I'm very proud of how that unit's come out. So I've been paying attention to everyone's Abyssal Dwarves uh, to make sure that I'm taking inspiration from the things that I think are nice, but also making sure I'm not just imitating what other people are doing down to the tiniest detail. So, also, I don't know if you noticed a slight change in camera position as well, uh, because I've got a new monitor, this PC, so the camera's now in a different place. This monitor is actually lower down and it's nice and tilted upwards so it's in a more natural position and the camera is actually a little bit lower than it was i think but also maybe a bit further away the microphone's also in, in a different spot because of all this so i don't know if you'll notice any difference there anyway abyssal dwarves and this scenario is i believe this one is scavenge i think that's what it's called uh, let's see. Dicey Guy says, is it death clock? Time up, you lose. No, if you time out on the clock, you don't auto lose. You're just not allowed to do anything else, basically. You're not allowed to roll any dice. You're not allowed to move any units. That's it. Your turns, just nothing happens in those turns. And that's that. Uh, different tournaments do it a different way. I've seen some tournaments where you're only allowed to pivot units when you run out of time. But most of them don't let you do anything at all when your clock runs out. So even if you're in the middle of a dice roll, and you haven't done the nerve yet for an attack and your clock hits zero and you haven't thrown the dice yet then you're not allowed to do it uh, i've usually seen it so that if you throw the nerve dice and the clock hits zero and you have to re-roll the dice because of inspiring for example then you can still do that because it's considered the same dice roll pretty much so there are different ways i haven't seen a tournament doing it as a death clock ever really i can't remember any tournament where if you hit zero you actually lose automatically i know it has happened but i've never witnessed those rules in effect at an event maybe that was on the way out before i got into the tournament scene so missile dwarves scavenge you've got three objectives on the center line and if you are controlling them at the start of one of your turns uh, then you can generate a loot token to carry each unit can only carry one and when you defeat a unit in combat, you can choose to destroy a token they were carrying rather than stealing it for yourself. Uh, because you can only carry one and perhaps you just would like to destroy it anyway. So, you can see that my opponent has got a big concentration of meaty goodness. On the right, as I look at it, and on the left, there's a very fast kind of wing of the army. Up in the top left there. And all the objectives are down here on the right. So, uh, I'm pretty pleased that all the fast stuff is quite far away, because when you see how powerful that wing of the army is, you'll see what I mean. I've, I've been able to get the majority of my meaty goodness into the centre where there are objectives. And I've positioned all my rot lobbers to, to fire into that middle area where all the objectives are. So that's somewhere my opponent has to be if he wants to win the game. So all the rock lobbers trained on that one spot. So this is on the right flank here. I've got the mincer and the spitters. The mincer is really just there to protect them in case anyone wants to come and attack them. And there's a token right over here as well. So if they can get forwards and just sit on that token and shoot off it and no one wants to attack them, that'd be great. So there's the rock lobbers. There's the blizzard wizard who's going to be hanging out with them. There's a couple of trombones backing up the rogger's goons. I've got my spitter horde there with the bruiser the wizard a load of trolls and there's another another trombone the third trombone out here it's towards the left with the king and the sniffs and some more trolls and some more sniffs so <clears throat> now the objective is all on the right here is the fast wing of my opponent's army there are some gargoyles one of them is basusu's gargoyles and there's basusu at the front as well there is also i think it's is it bracky the character that's on a the, the half-breed hero who's very powerful and then there are two half-breed regiments uh, one of them has the caterpillar which is i think the one that doesn't have a dice on it and the one that has a dice on it has something else do i have a copy of this list here let's see <clears throat> yes i do in fact so the one that has a dice on it has the brew of haste i think and the other one has the potion of the caterpillar and there's also an overmaster on ancient winged half-breed so everything here is really fast and really dangerous. The gargoyles may be less dangerous, but they are really fast still. So if I can just tie up all this stuff and prevent it getting into my flank for the whole game, 
which is why I've gone for a bit of a, a setup down here of sniffs, sniffs, ping, who can shoot as well, and a trombone. They're designed, I'm just going to try and shoot up the, particularly the, the chaff style units there, and then there are some trolls just to be a bit of a threat there as well. So, the main blob of opponent meat we've got here, there is a horde of black souls with the brew of strength. There is, there are three dragonfire teams you can see there around Infernoch, and two lesser obsidian golem hordes, one with the orcish skull pole and one with the pipes of terror, which have a very similar effect. There is a slave master hanging around there as well, and there's also, or a slave driver, should I say. And uh, yes, so Bracky is the character I was thinking of. And then there's also Dravik, who is the one that can heal Infernoch with his fireball ability. And there is the formation, the Bardoom formation, that gives, I believe it gives the half-breeds uh, something extra. I can't remember what it is right now. But anyway, there is anything else to mention here? So lots of hard-hitting stuff, uh, some breath attacks there, and really, that's the lot. So my strategy here, get up onto the tokens, try and generate some tokens, and then survive the furious attack of the enemy, because it's mainly close combat based, whereas mine is mainly shooting. So I, don't, I wouldn't like to push forward too much. If I was able to just hug the back line against this force and just stay there for the whole game, that'd be great. But alas. So pushing forward immediately onto those tokens. So I think I'm actually within three inches of two of those tokens. Possibly not the one. Maybe the one in, on the right there. I can't remember. But the one on the left, definitely. And everybody else just moving up into a position to shoot the gargoyles. And the sniffs and the king do shoot off one of the troops of gargoyles immediately. So that's a good start. And these sniffs shoot the other troop of gargoyles and do some damage to them. So I just want to get them out of the way so I can start focusing on other things. But they would be annoying. So as I was saying at the beginning of the video, I want to focus on killing things that are killable. And not just necessarily chipping away on units all the time so that they're still at full strength. Just making sure to kill things every turn. Just limit the number of units the opponent has. Just keep up the momentum by just removing things every single turn, ideally. So all my shooting over here. I target the dragon fire teams and waver one of them and wound the other. And that's a, a decent start going on there. Taking out some gargoyles, wavered a dragon fire team. I'll take that as a start. Turn two for the enemy. So. You can see that the fast wing have moved up, uh, mostly into those woods. They can start shooting and shooting, but charging out of them, shall we say, and getting shooting cover. And as you look at this picture, I will be right back in one moment. Okay, we are back, and uh, pushing forward there, so I think one of the Dragonfire teams is in range to be able to shoot now. And let's see, there you go, five damage onto Grogger's Goons, which is okay because they've got regeneration. So you'll notice that nearly all my fighter units have regeneration, uh, so quite happy for them to be shot at, as long as it's only in small doses. And there's how it's looking. So I'm going to have to kill those gargoyles on the left to stop them charging anybody. But they're already damaged, so I've got a good chance. And then I'm going to have to make sure I don't leave anyone with the possibility of being charged by half-breeds or the Overmaster or even Basusu, because that would be very dangerous. And there's how the other flank's looking. So those obsidian golems are up onto the hill, but they could see over it regardless. So they're threatening me, 
But I'm not sure they really would like to just charge in there and get attacked by a pincer. They wouldn't, they probably wouldn't die. But it's giving them something to think about, you can tell. And they also have to be wary if they head that way, the patrol bruiser can potentially get over there. And if that could flank them, that could potentially be bad news for them because they rely on their high defense. And the bruiser, one of the few things that has crushing strength three out there, you especially wouldn't want to give him a flank, for instance. So those gargoyles in the top right aren't actually there. They're, that's the dead pile there. Turn two for the goblins. So just chilling out here. Uh, not too worried about moving forward. I just want to threaten that objective. If the enemy wants to come forward onto it. Okay. And if I can just tie up an entire horde of lesser obsidian golems with a mincer and a few puny little archers, then that's going to be fine by me. So what does my shooting battery get up to here? Well, you can see I've made a token with the bruiser immediately, right there. So he was within three inches of the objective. And my shooting battery... Well, there's another token made by trolls on the other objective as well. I managed to wave at one of those dragonfire teams and kill the other. So just concentrate on killing things. So I think one's dead, one's wavered, and one of them has been left alone for a turn. I think I also uh, cast Critter's Call on the the character, I think it's Dravik, just to stop him being able to use any of his spells next turn. So I did one damage to him by the looks of it there. I think that's correct. Then you can see that there's bits of damage being plinked onto the golems as well, with whatever happened to be in range of them. And here, this is something that it would be great for a, a troop of cavalry. Uh, it's a bit, it gets a bit expensive to do this routinely with full regiments, but I do not want the trolls to take a charge from anything right now. I want this fight to last a while. I don't want both my units to be attacked at the same time, because this is the side of the board where I'm totally outmatched in points and in uh, strength of the units that are there. So I just want to hold them up as long as possible while I'm winning on the other side. So one way to do that is to make sure that only one unit can be charged. So hiding the trolls directly behind them, making sure no one has a flank on them, making sure no one can touch the front of the trolls because they're right up behind the sniffs, and the sniffs are a good unit to accomplish that with because they're nimble, so you can pivot to get them in exactly the right angle to achieve this. So if anyone wants to charge the sniffs, they're free to. If the half-breeds want to charge in there, that's fine. Then the trolls will charge them and might possibly kill them. If... Basusu or somebody wants to charge into the sniffs, okay, that means that Basusu is not flying off causing havoc elsewhere. So, yeah, and if they want to do a big multi-charge, and some of them are individuals, there's always the risk that the trolls could kill one of the individuals and overrun into something else. So just giving my opponent food for thought there, and you can see that I have shot off the gargoyles with the sniffs and the king on the hill. So both units of gargoyles are dead, I'm very pleased about that and a teensy bit of damage done onto the half-breeds. I think the king may have shot at the half-breeds because the gargoyles were already close to double one. So, another successful shooting turn, got rid of one unit, blinked a bit of damage, wavered another breath attack, and created some tokens on some of my units. On to turn two for the Abyssal Dwarves. So, after careful consideration, the Abyssal Dwarf General elects to thrust Raki and Basusu into the Sniffs. So, two individuals, uh, meaning that there there is a risk attached to this, of course, in that if the trolls charge one of those individuals and get lucky, they could overrun into the other one and could then get lucky and overrun into the half-breeds. So there is risk attached to it. But it's, I don't think the trolls have that big of a chance of killing one of those heroes in one round. Everything else moving forward. And of course there isn't going to be surging going on. Because I think it was this turn that I used Critter's Call on that hero. I think. And they're just getting themselves in position. And I'm surprised that the obsidian golems on the right are still hanging back as much as they are. 
Maybe they are just concerned about that troll bruiser. I think if they went forward, he would potentially have a flank on them, so that could be in their thinking there. They could just shuffle sideways, though. So I'm wondering why they're not being more aggressive, because they're really only up against two pretty feeble units over on the right there. <clears throat> so you can see that the sniffs are killed by that double individual charge, and a Bracky has stayed forward, and Susu has decided to fall back, which does leave me in a position where I could potentially kill them both, overrun them both, and still fight the half-breeds, who are no longer in the woods either, so it wouldn't even be a hindrance. It would have to be, it would, would be relying on some serious luck to do that, but it is possible. So, looking healthy at the moment. I managed to keep the enemy off the units I want to keep them off, and we're quite a way into the game at this stage. Of turns already. So turn three, four, the goblins. So again, I'm not moving too much around there, just a bit of a standoff. And the trombones and the shooting wing here, what do they do? With the rock lobbers as well? Well, they kill Infernoc. So I just focus fired everything on Infernoc. Rock lobbers, I fired, probably fired the rock lobbers first, or after, maybe after the trombones because they only had one target, but rock lobbers. A couple of them probably hit him, and then I thought, you know what, he's almost dead, let's try and chip in with other units as well, just to get him right up there, because if he doesn't die, then uh, Dravek can heal him up with his fireball, so you've got to kill him in one go and not let him get healed, so I just piled the pressure on him, killed Infernoc, he's toast. He's also very scary, because once you get into a big battle line situation with the Abyssal Dwarves, Infernoc is one of those units that's completely square, but can also be surged. So that means he can turn 90 degrees without coming to within an inch of enemy units and still be surged. Whereas, for example, the lesser obsidian golems, they're too wide. So if you want to surge them, you can't do you can't do the equivalent of the corkscrew charge, they call it, but with a, a surge. You can't do that with them because they're too wide, but you can do it with Infernoc because he's a perfect square base. Okay. So my Troll Bruiser charged around those Obsidian Golems into the Black Souls just to kind of tie them up in place to stop a, a furious multi-charge or charging multiple units taking place. So the Bruiser with his Nimble is very handy for that. And then the Obsidian Golems are charged by the Goons and the, one of the Troll Hordes. 10 damage, so we've got them up there and hopefully we'll be able to kill them next time. Now this Troll Horde charge into Bracky, but can't quite kill him in one round. It would have been nice if they could get that overrun towards Basusu, but alas. But I am holding up the enemy in this area for longer than they would have liked. And you'll notice that the winged, oh, the winged half, great winged half breed with the Overmaster didn't even attack anyone last turn because I didn't leave anyone juicy in range, so it's just holding back. And the longer I can keep those units out of the fight, the better it is for me. So the sniffs there are backing away from those half-breeds and just plinking shots away at them. And waver them. So a nice bonus there. That's another unit that isn't going to be fighting for a turn. So I think the tactics are paying off over here. I've turned the trolls on the hill. So they are looking towards the enemy, which means that potentially the overmaster will be able to charge them next turn. Uh, but we've got another token generated as well. So both those troll units, I think, have tokens to in the around that hill in the middle there. And there is also a token that was dropped by the troll bruiser, just sitting out in the open that someone else can come and pick up in a minute. Turn three for the Abyssal Dwarves. So instead of going for those trolls uh, that they were in front of, Susu, Bracky, and the winged Beastie decide to attack the trolls that were on the hill, and I've just remembered I did not use Critter's Call on Dravok earlier, it was Blizzard. So he could have potentially used his spells, but I don't think he managed to do anything useful with them. There wasn't a lot to do really, because I've been killing things and not necessarily just slowly applying wounds. Uh, just I just remembered, because I remembered what I do end up using Critter's Call for in a minute, so you'll see. Those trolls are probably going to get munched to death there. The half-breeds then charge out the woods, but these are the ones with the caterpillar. 
into the troll horde. But this is a Dwarven Ale Trolls, so I'd be hoping that they would just become wavered and then be able to counter charge, hopefully. And you can see that the Golems there have counter charged into the Trolls. Black Souls counter charge the Bruiser. And these Golems, Lesser Obsidian Golems here, have kind of given up on going for my flank force, which is going to leave me with that right hand objective all to myself which is quite juicy, because they really want to go and eat them some Frogger's goons. So they turn around and they're going to get surged into the flank now. So while the unit of Grogger's goons gets flamed first by that breath attack, followed by a surge into the flank. So uh, they'll probably die as a result of that. Or will they? Well, let's see, they're up to 29 damage and they have a nerve 21. Double one. Tournament reroll. There is one reroll per game in this tournament. Also a one. So Grogger's goons survive massively against the odds there after being flanked by obsidian golems. And let's just see how critical a position this is. So if they die, uh, the golems are then pretty much in on the flank of my trolls there. So my trolls would have to kill the other golems next turn and then turn around to face them, but there are threats coming in from the left as well, so ideally I would not like to have to do that yet. So the fact that Grogger's goons are still alive is holding that unit in place for another turn, which is very, very handy. The bruiser gets wavered, which is quite commonplace for him when he fights anything remotely useful. And the trolls take a bit of damage from the obsidian golems, but not that much. The trolls in the middle, though, do get killed by that massive combo charge of doom, and the overmaster has stolen the token from the trolls, which in some ways is okay because it'll give him second thoughts about flying now, because he would have to drop it. And the trolls are killed by the half-breeds that charged out the woods as well. So that flank has uh, kind of crumbled. I've still got some sniffs over there, but that was the hope, really. I was just hoping to tie this side up for a while. So I've got a big threat of those three really dangerous characters perched on that hill, and I'm going to have to use some toasty goodness to try and flame them into oblivion now. And I've got trolls carrying a token, and you can see them right in the middle of the picture almost, the trolls with that token there, and there's one just sitting on the floor between the trombone and the lesser obsidian golems there. So, uh, Grogger's goons are going to die at some point. Next time they take any damage, they'll be dead, unless they can regenerate all their wounds by some miracle. So I really just want to use them to hold up those obsidian golems for one more turn. That's all they need to do. Uh, because by then, I think, with any luck, I'll have shot off enough other stuff that it'll be too late for them to help. So, turn four. And I move the mincer and the spitters up towards that objective so they can start generating tokens next turn and there's no one there to threaten them at the moment. So they're having a good, really good time there. Grog's goons countercharge the obsidian golems and actually get quite a lot of their wounds back, but it's not going to be enough to stop them being killed next time, you would think. And uh, really just holding them up. The trolls do manage to kill the other obsidian golems though, and they turn round, and you can see what the dilemma would have been if those other golems had still been alive, because I would have had uh, the golems here on the right and the winged overmaster, or the winged half-breed with the overmaster on the left, so I wouldn't have wanted to present a flank to either of those, but I would have had to. So the fact that Grogger's goons were double wand is very important there. And the trolls with the token there have uh, just turned to face the imminent threats, and then I tromboned and shot with the king uh, Bracky, so Bracky is dead. And there was a bit of damage done to the Overmaster as well there. It looks like he's on five. I haven't attacked Basusu yet. Uh, so there's dead Bracky, who was flamed to death with trombones. The sniffs that are hiding in the corner actually kill the half-breeds as well that were out here. So they weren't really affecting the game at the moment, but it's another unit dead. And there's how it's looking. So, it's actually looking fairly healthy. And I think this turn I, is when I used Critter's Call on the Overmaster on Great Winged Halfbreed, because I do not want him to land anywhere. For example, I don't want him to attack my Spitter Horde, for instance, uh, because they're carrying a token, and he 
he could potentially kill them. Uh, with Basusu assisting as well, those two together could definitely kill that unit in one round, and they are in range to attack. As you can see, I moved the spitters up there to collect the token, and both of those flying in and attacking them could kill it, that unit. And I wouldn't want that at this stage, so I used Critter's Call on the big flying beastie, so he's not going to be able to fly next turn. And he's carrying a token anyway, so he would have been hesitant, perhaps, to fly anyway. But just to make absolutely sure, I want him to be charging something that's either fighty or just complete chaff in the middle. Turn 4 for the Abyssal Dwarves. So, a turn later than expected. Uh, the golems are hopefully going to kill off Grogger's goons now. Basusu and the Overmaster charge into this flagget so that they'll be able to overrun and then the Overmaster will go straight into the trolls. Which I'm, I'm not sure was really a necessary step. I think Basusu could have killed the flagget by itself and then the Overmaster could have just gone straight into the trolls and didn't need to help with the flagget. So maybe he just wanted to guarantee that the flagget was dead, but there was a risk of double wanting the flagget and not even reaching the trolls. So, hmm. And you can see here the half breeds had one target they could see, which was a trombone. So that's going to die. So we are going to lose some units here. The bruiser has been charged again as well, but I am holding a token, and I'm going to be able to create more shortly. I think the Overmaster is still carrying a token, it just hasn't been moved along with his wound dice yet. You can still see them on the left there. Jonathan, looking for tips after this weekend's disaster. Well, yes, your unique list didn't seem to go exactly according to plan, I would say. So, if you want to pick up tips from the Goblin Maestro, this is definitely the place to be. Okay, so what do these little ranged attacks do here? Well, okay, so this is another reason that this was perhaps a good move here. So this is probably the thinking. Wanting to shoot the trolls first to soften them up so that then the overrun can go into them. So and if that was the thinking, then thumbs up for that one because you can get them damaged and then overrun into them, which is always juicy. And they actually get wavered just from the shooting. And then the flagget is, of course, killed and the overrun takes place. Basusu doesn't reach anyone else, though. And the Overmaster you would expect to kill those trolls now, and it does. So it's now turned to face the other trolls and the War Trombone. The Bruiser takes a bit more damage, but he's okay. And the War Trombone is killed by the Half-Breeds, quite handily. And Grogger's Goons are finally dead. They pick up a zillion more damage, and they are finally toast, but they have held up that unit for even longer than expected. And that horde of Lesser Obsidian Golems there are currently controlling that objective. So if they can still be in that position next turn, they could start generating a token there. So all the units in the top right there are dead. They're just in the dead pile up there. So at the end of that turn, it's actually looking good for me at the moment. This fight is still kind of up in the air because there are enemy units left alive with a lot of health. But the trolls are about to charge the Overmaster. And that's going to be not that difficult to fight, I think. It's already on five wounds. I could easily kill it with the trolls with any decent rolling there. And over on the right, there is the Mincer, who has started, who's picked up a token already, I think. Or if he hasn't, then he's about to. And then there's the Spitter Regiment there as well, who can also get a token at some point. I've got enough time left. Two tokens to be made there, and there are no enemies threatening them at this stage. Got my Spitters with a token. So what my opponent wanted to do, actually, was you saw earlier in the turn how those Lesser Obsidian Golems in the middle there were going to charge, or they were going to counter charge into Grogger's Goons. What he was thinking was that they could turn on the spot and then be surged into the flank of my Spitters. But then, of course, you remember what I was talking about earlier with Infernoch, the fact that he's a perfect square means that he's actually allowed to do that. Uh, whereas the Lesser Obsidian Golems, when they're an inch away from a unit, they can't actually turn sideways unless they're charging something because they're too wide. So they end up within an inch after the turn, which is not legal, so they weren't able to do that. So they had to waste an entire another turn fighting Grogger's Goons. 
which is why I do rate Greater Obsidian Golems and Infernoch quite highly for that purpose, being a perfect square like that. Turn 5 for the Goblins. So there is a token created by the Mincer, and they're just happy sitting there. They've barely done anything all game, but they could potentially win it for me at this point. So down here, what does my shooting accomplish? I've got my spitters there, I've got my trombones. Uh, there's some damage being put onto Basusu there. And shooting from the sniffs. Kills off the half-breeds that just killed a... They just killed the war trombone last time. Let me see whether they were on any damage yet. Let's see here. Uh, there they are. I don't think they were damaged yet, so I must have I shot them with a few different units, I think, and killed them off. And the War Trombones killed off the Lesser Obsidian Golem Horde as well, so I must have hit them with a couple of rocks as well, by the looks of things. So they are dead. The Half-Breeds are dead, with the assist from the Sniffs there at the back. Uh, the Trolls waver the Overmaster, with 15 damage on it. So that's not going to be able to attack anybody. The Trolls have got a token. Uh, the Bruiser is chipping away at the Black Souls. I've also wavered, by the looks of it, the Dragonfire team, which I believe would have been done with the Spitters, the Spitter Regiment over on the right there. So wavered Dragonfire team, wavered Overmaster. Uh, the Lesser Obsidian Golems are dead. Half-Breeds are dead. My opponent only has two units that can hold tokens now, and I've got five. Uh, so it's looking very good at this point. Turn five for the Abyssal Dwarves. So Basusu decides, you know what, Mr. Bruiser, I've had enough of your antics. We need you out of the way so we can get these Black Souls towards Token Town. So I'm going to double charge the Bruiser, make sure he dies. Then in the middle, uh, there's not much going on there, but a bit of repositioning of characters. And of course, the Bruiser is dead. As a result of that, Basusu is an absolute monster, and that's how they look after that. And not much, because there aren't many Abyssal Dwarf units left. So, turn six for the Goblins. <sighs> and the Spitters create another token from that one. So they've got one each there, quite happily. Wavered the, oh, the uh, Dravak, I think that is. So he's wavered, as a result of shooting. And I think, I think that's the trolls have killed off the horde, not the horde, the overmaster. They finished him off, he was wavered last time, killed him this time, so he's dead. And they've got a token, quite happily. And the rock lobbers finish off the horde of black souls. So my opponent, uh, I don't think has any units capable of holding tokens left. So... The only thing, the, all the units at the top there are dead, so there's just those three individuals left for my opponent now, and I've got four units holding tokens. So really, I just want the game to end now so he doesn't get a chance to kill anything, because it's looking very healthy at the moment. Well, I want it to end at the, at the end of this turn. So Basusu charges into the trolls and does a bit of damage. Not enough to kill them, and the other characters are just milling around. Uh, killing off uh, probably a war trombone. And turn there is a turn 7, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to... It's going to give me the opportunity to try and kill Basusu. And the trolls do actually wave a Basusu, but she has Fury, so she's going to get another chance to try and kill them and deprive me of a point. So that's how it looks at the end of my turn 7, uh, with most of those units up at the top being dead. Just those three Abyssal Dwarf individuals alive. And they've got no chance of killing all my units. So really they just have to try and kill something and get more points. So turn 7 for the Abyssal Dwarves. And Basusu does finish off the trolls, so they have to lose their token. So at the end of the game, I've got three tokens. My opponent has zero. So a juicy win there. Lots of killing for both sides. Very little left alive. And two pretty hefty wins there at the end of day one to put me in a decent position heading into day two. And the first game of day two. Let's see, do I have a copy of this list at all? Because this is undead. 
I do not think I have a copy of this one. I do have a list for the next game, but not for this one. So, against Undead, and this is Pillage, with six objectives. So there are six objectives out there on the battlefield, and if you are controlling them at the end of the game, you get a point. Now, this is quite a, a fairly elite Undead list, but there are some other units in there that just bulk up the number of units a bit, which are quite interesting. So, you can see where the objectives are for the most part. You can see the four of them kind of zigzagging from the centre to my opponent's half. And there are also two on my half, one right behind the spitters at the bottom of the screen there, and the other one right at the far end of my line, just in front of the spitter regiment there. There is another little blue token, which I don't know if you can see very well in this shot, but hopefully. And I positioned both of those tokens on this half of the table, and then I won the roll off, so I was able to select this side. So it was a bit of a gamble, but I knew that I've got certain units that don't want to be moving very much, so I just want them to sit there, shooting the enemy, and then at the end of the game, if they're still alive, they're controlling a token. So, great. My opponent wants to move forward a lot more, so can't really uh, afford to sit back too much. There is a, a horde of skeleton archers, though, which we'll get to in a moment. So, the deployment. We've got trolls, and the bruiser, and some sniffs over on this flank. You'll see what they're coming up against in a minute. We've got my spitters in the woods, with a wizard just hanging out behind the woods, ready He's positioned there because the skeleton archers are across from him, so he wants to dip in there, and then when the skeleton archers are primed to strike, maybe use Critter's Call on them. Then we've got the Grogger's Goons there, backed up by a trombone. Then we've got two troll hordes, backed up by more trombones, and the flagget with the diadem. Got most of my rot lobbers in the middle there with the blizzard wizard. And then we've got the spitters out there with the other token there. And over on this flank, we've got a mincer, we've got the king, We've got the Sniffs, part two, and we've got one of the Lobbers. So, what are they looking at? There is a troop of Revenant Cavalry and a Vampire and a Pegasus. So the one Lobber down here is specifically to deal with those threats. And the shooting I've got down here is shooting, not only shooting, but shooting with speed, because there is Cavalry and there's a Flyer. So the King and the Sniffs can both match speed with the Flyer. So just to give me a bit more defence down here. Then there is a horde of skeletons. There is another troop of Revenant cavalry. There is a regiment of Soul Reaver infantry. Uh, between them, between the two sides here, there is Lady Alona in the middle. And there's also Mortibris hanging out somewhere as well. So he gives stealthy to units within six inches. So. The Soul Reavers on both sides and the Revenant Cavalry Troops on both sides are going to be stealthy, so that's going to affect who I'm going to shoot at in this game, because I don't want to waste Rot Lobbers firing at things all the time when I'm hitting on sixes. Then you've got the uh, Skeleton Archers there, which seem, they look a little like ghoulish musketeers rather than Skeleton Archers, but that's what they're being used as. Then there are some more Revenant Cavalry. So I haven't seen an Undead Army with this many troops of Revenant Cavalry before. So we'll see how they do. Another Skeleton Horde and some Werewolves. So the Skeletons are part of the formation with the Necromancer so that he gets extra dice when he casts spells on them and they also gain Iron Resolve. There's also the Lady Alona formation with the two Soul Reaver Infantry Regiments as well so they get extra speed and they become fearless. So there's the token on my spitters, there's the other one on my spitters, and there's some tokens just hanging out in the centre. So, I would this hill here, if I go first, presents me with an opportunity to equalise with the speed of the werewolves, because they can't see over the hill. I've only got height two units or smaller on that side of the table, so if I push forward I can possibly keep them off the hill, because if they go on the hill they would then be within charge range of something. So I'd force them to kind of limit the effectiveness of their speed uh, because they can't see over that hill. And if they want to attack me, they're going to have to come into my range. So first turn could be important there. And I do get first turn and immediately start threatening with what I just said there, pushing the bruiser up. So if those were werewolves want to charge anyone, 
they're going to have to get onto the hill and the bruiser will be able to charge them. The other trolls moving up, the sniffs have just positioned themselves so they can shoot. And the piece of terrain that has an effect on this game, uh, in some of the games I haven't been mentioning it because it hasn't come up that much, but the one in this game I think gives you minus one to your nerve or something like that. It's that little rock formation you can see at the bottom left there. So I'm keeping my units out of range of that, which is why I've got the trolls single file and not spread out, because I don't want them going close to that thing, because it does give them some kind of negative modifier. In the middle, uh, pushing up. Again, I've got a nice hill to play with here. Most of the enemy units won't be able to see over it, but of course, because they're undead, they've got the option to surge units, so they don't always have to be able to see to charge, so you have to keep that in mind as well. And over on this flank, just moving up into shooting range with everything. Uh, that's the important thing, just edge up just an inch over the line if that's all it takes to get to within range to shoot in the first turn, just to maximise the impact. And what do we do with this little shooting battery here with the king and the sniffs? Start plinking damage onto the revenants there. Revenant cavalry, the rock lobbers. Well, they immediately delete one unit of revenant cavalry there. This is a unit from around the middle of the board here, next to the skeleton archers with the necromancer behind them so they were killed immediately and then blizzard and the spitters put damage onto the, the skeleton archers uh, there wasn't really uh, too much else that was a viable threat to them i couldn't see the necromancer yet because the cavalry was still there so that's how it looks quite happy with that as a first turn got some damage in there and killed the unit and those the units I've targeted have been ones that are outside of Mortabris's stealth bubble. You can see him actually right in the middle of the woods there. So I'll, when I get the chance, I'm going to be targeting him, preferably with Blizzard, to get rid of that stealth bubble if I get the opportunity. Everything else, I'm going to be targeting anything that's not within stealthy range, just to maximise what I can kill. And then even though the Soul Reaver infantry are incredibly nasty, they'll kill the first thing they touch. They're not as survivable as Soul Reaver cavalry. So I think if I can get a troll horde charging them, maybe with a bit of an assist from either a, a bruiser, even though I've not used him in that role in this game, but anything else assisting them. So a double charge, maybe with the goons or the king or someone like that, could potentially take them out. The, the trolls on their own, I wouldn't be confident they would kill the Soul Reaver infantry in one round. But I have got trombones to finish things off as well. I've got all three trombones in the middle, which is exactly where those units are. Turn one for the enemy. So moving up as you'd expect, not that fast because they're undead after all. So the extra speed for the Soul Reaver infantry, they're not using it to its fullest, but uh, would you really want to be pushing them out in front against a gun line anyway? Probably not. It's keeping them mainly out of sight behind troops, this strategy. Pegasus Vampire is just chilling out there. He can easily fly and attack someone, so I'm going to be targeting him with my Rock Lobbers soon. And Mortabris is hiding behind the hill. Everyone else is staying within his stealth bubble. So the Skeletons have gone up onto the hill, and this is presenting an interesting situation now because the Werewolves are not really engaging in the game. Uh, but that's negating their speed advantage somewhat for keeping them back there. However, the Skeleton Horde and the Werewolf Horde together are probably cheaper than a Bruiser and two Troll Hordes. So I am going to want to get into a fight there at some point. But what I want to do is send in units that can lure the Werewolves out and then furiously countercharge them with other units. So we'll see what I've got in mind for that in a minute. Over here, uh, that's the lineup. And there's Lady Ilona. And look at that hairy human arm there. So what does Lady Alona do? She lightning bolts and puts a little bit of damage onto those sniffs. The Necromancer, I believe he surges the skeleton archers forward so they can remain stationary and still shoot without penalty. And they put some damage onto the trolls. I think they have the piercing item actually, the skeleton archers. I think that is correct. So damage on the trolls. But I've put the Dwarven Ale unit at the front, in case they get wavered. And the other unit behind them. So, it's a, a threatening lineup the Undead have got here, with all those Soul Reavers and Elona and the Pegasus Vampire. 
uh, but I'm not overly concerned about the cavalry. I think I can shoot them off. It's just a question of whether I can survive the charge that comes after that. Turn two for the goblins. So I'm keeping everything out of sight of the werewolves here. The sniffs are moving up so they can shoot the werewolves and also remain out of danger. And those skeletons have got an option now. Do you take a multi-charge? Because they're currently on the hill, and I think all three units are in range of them. All the three troll units there. So do they stay on the hill and get charged? Do they move backwards and just try and turn this into a bit of a stalemate? We shall see. Grogger's goons move up. They're not on the hill, so they're not they're blocking any rock lovers or anything. And they are just kind of uh, inviting the enemy who would like to charge us because we've got units behind that are going to toast you and charge you. The troll unit, the right hand troll unit of the two there in particular, is going to be able to charge anyone that wants to get involved in that little situation there. Got lots of shooting there as well. Over here, what does this shooting barrage accomplish this turn? The Sniffs and the King, well, they kill off the troop of Revenant Knights that were hanging out there. Rot lobbers, what do they do? Well, they hit nothing this turn. So, the Spitters and the Wizard, what do they do this time? Well, I put Critter's Call on the Necromancer this turn, because if you, well, we'll see on the wide shot why I did that. Trombone, uh, trombones the knights and puts a teensy bit of damage on them. So you look at the situation with the skeletons there. There's a possibility uh, that A, they could have been surged into uh, maybe a flank on the bruiser. Uh, not sure if it was possible, but it is possible. And also they were, there's the possibility of other units being surged and units, I think the necromancer might have heal as well. So I didn't want any surging to take place next turn. I wanted as few units getting involved in the action as possible. And there is, he also has a huge amount of Bane Chant, which is going to be important potentially next turn. Uh, because the skeletons could charge someone. He, when he's casting his spells on the skeletons, he gains five extra dice, even on Bane Chant. So it's like guaranteed Bane Chant. So I thought the Necromancer would very much like to be getting into the action next turn. So I thought I'd Critters Call him and just prevent him from doing that for a turn. Turn two for the undead. So the skeletons decide to back away. They're not getting into this fight and they're just letting me have that hill at the moment. So I still want to lure the werewolves into the action. So see what I'm going to do with regards to that. Because while the skeletons are moving away, they may still be in sight of one troll horde. So I do have an option for a charge there. Over here, we've got a, we're going to have an attempted triple charge. So the Revenant Knights have moved into position and then the Soul Reavers have charged into the Grogger's Goons. The other two units are going to be surged towards them. That was the only way they could all physically fit into the spots that my opponent wanted them in. So, uh, because had the, had, they all, had the two units in front both just charged in, they would have been overhanging too far so that the Revenants on the left wouldn't be able to be surged into the flank. So this is the only way to do it. And Mortabris and Elona can both surge a little bit. So we'll see whether they can succeed with that. So you can see where Elona's hanging out. And she does successfully surge that unit in, into the front. But Mortabris is one inch short of surging them into the flank. So Grogger's goons may actually survive that. You never know. Over on this side, you can see the necromancers hiding behind the skeletons as well. So Grogger's goons do not survive. The furious double charge there. And the Soul Reavers move backwards to prevent them being the target of too much juiciness next time. And the Knights go backwards as well. Look at that red hot sizzling tape measure action there. So those Knights on the hill are just kind of flapping in the wind and I'm going to be able to attack them. So next turn is when I'm really going to go for it and throw things in there. Turn three. So, King charges the skeleton horde. The flagget sits in front of the Soul Reaver infantry. It, of course it's going to die, but that's fine. 
because it's just there because you'll see uh, the trolls are going to charge the flank of those knights that were on the hill. And I don't want them to be charged by the Soul Reapers next turn. I want to get another turn out of them. So I'll show you what happens there. And you can see there, they charge the flank of the knights, kill them. And then the only way to prevent the Soul Reavers charging them next turn is to keep them in this position. If they turn to face the Soul Reavers, they would take a frontal charge uh, because of the angles involved. It was possible for the Soul Reavers to get past the flagget and get to them, I think, the position they were in. So they had to move backwards to avoid the potential for that. So uh, they're not looking at anyone, but they are going to survive another turn at the expense of the flagget. The trombone moves up to just box in those units a bit and shoots up the knights a bit. And there's how the middle's looking now. So keeping most things out of range and out of sight, but over here, lots of shooting going on. And rock lobbers manage to waver the Pegasus vampire. So really nice, he's not gonna be able to attack anyone next turn now. And over this side is where I'm really thrusting in now. So after lots of careful measuring, I worked out that if the trolls that could see the skeletons charge them, if they then get flanked by the werewolves, if the werewolves don't kill them, they would be flanked by the troll bruiser and no doubt countercharged. And there's other trolls down here as well, so the werewolves would immediately go kaboom. If they do kill the trolls, they would have to fall back three inches to get off the hill, by my calculation. So that's a two in three chance, if they choose to fall back, that they're going to be flanked by a bruiser and charged in the front by a troll unit, which they would not risk, I'm pretty sure. They would rather just turn to face that. But even then, a bruiser and a troll horde in the front, I'm confident would be enough to kill the werewolves anyway. So it's it's kind of a trap, but it's the best kind of trap, where it's a trap where it's also not a horrendous move for your opponent to do it. If it's a, a trap where your opponent would just have to be a complete idiot to go for it because it's really a really bad move, then no one's going to fall for it. It has to be a juicy trap. You have to have backed someone into a corner so that their best option is a bad one. Because if they if the werewolves don't charge those trolls, then the turn after that, I would just eat those skeletons for lunch, finish them off, and then turn to face the werewolves so you wouldn't have a, the option of a flank charge, and then the trolls would be closing in. So the best option isn't a good one which is the dream scenario to get your opponent in. And then after they've done that, I'll have units hanging out on this objective here because I've got my sniffs in this area. So it's a place they would love to be able to sit and just shoot at the enemy until the end of the game. Brian says it's 8 a.m. here in the US. I have to try, I have to not try to watch this at work. Well, it depends what your work is. If you're let's say an air traffic controller, I would say do not watch this because you'd probably cause some serious incidents. If you're something perhaps a little bit more laid back, then maybe take it into consideration. So there's how the table's looking at the moment. And I've killed quite a few enemy units. I think most of the cavalry are dead. And the so they're looking a little bit thin on the ground, definitely. I'm not, I'm not sure if I've lost anything yet. I'm definitely about to lose something. So turn three for my opponent. Skeletons back into the king. Soul Reavers are going to eat the flagget for dinner, but it, they're keeping my trolls alive for a turn. Ilona decides to go after a war trombone. Soul Reavers decide to go after a war trombone, and the reason they've not slid over is because there were knights sitting there as well, and the knights moved afterwards. So... The werewolves do go in, they do get the flank charge on the trolls, and the skeletons in the front, so they'll probably kill them, but then I'm going to be able to charge the werewolves, and when you look at the huge amount of damage that the trolls did to those skeletons, those skeletons should be a prime juicy target for being shot off next turn as well, so I would hope to clear out this flank next turn. Mortabris, what does he do? Heals up some wounds on the Pegasus. Skeleton archers, what do they do? Put some wounds on these trolls, and that would have been bad if he could have wavered my backup trolls. That would have slightly scuppered my plans there. So the troll horde do get killed, and the werewolves decide the safest option is to just turn and make sure everyone's in the front. And the king takes some damage from the skeletons, but not much. 
and the flagget is killed. So this king here, there is a, a, this is the one kind of misunderstanding that happened or miscommunication during the tournament. Uh, in this game, my opponent was Spanish. And I think when we were working out whether the king was wavered, my opponent rolled four on the dice, which would have been one short of being waver. But I think I initially made a mistake and said that he was wavered. And then my opponent offered a one of his waver counters to put on the unit. And then when I was pointing out that, oh, actually, no, he's not wavered, but that's one short of the required number, my opponent thought that I was saying, no, I don't need a token. I think that's what happened there. So then in the subsequent turn, there was a situation where I was thinking about doing something with the king when, when my opponent thought he had become wavered. So in the end, because it wasn't that, that important a move I wanted to make anyway, I decided to just leave the king where he was due to the miscommunication. So you can see those soul reavers there do go straight past Flagget by annihilating him. And they're now in the flank of those trolls, but the trolls are still alive for a turn, which is important to be able to shoot those soul reavers, hopefully. Trombone on that side is killed by the other soul reavers. We're not on the hill, but my trolls can see them. And Ilona kills a trombone as well, and is now sitting in the middle of my army, and she's a big threat, so I'm going to have to deal with her. So, there's how it's looking at the end of that turn. And we'll see if my master plan for the right flank is going to pay off, because you can see those knights have sensed that something's up as well, and they're heading in this direction, so I'm going to have to try and shoot them off as well. Turn four for the goblins. So the double charge into the werewolves does kill them. He sniffs, and all my shooting down here I managed to kill off those knights that would have been threatening the flanks of my trolls if I'd left them alive. I don't think I managed to finish off the... Skeletons up here though. I think they survive. I didn't I wasn't able to shoot enough at them Over here my trolls charge into the soul reavers five damage so Looking a bit dicey there. What do the rocks manage to accomplish? Well, they kill off the pegasus vampire a couple of hits and down he goes So you can see my king is just chilling out in front of them now what I would have liked to have done if the king since the king wasn't wavered, I think I wanted to try and park him in front of the soul reavers a bit. But like I was saying, because of the miscommunication, I decided it would be best just to leave him there. So, turn four. And we have the skeleton archers. Who I'm forcing to move now, because the unit they want to shoot at are these sniffs, who are going to be quite important to the game, because I want to leave them up there to hold an objective. So I'm keeping them out of the shooting range, of the skeleton archers at all times, just moving them a little bit each time. So they either have to move and suffer a penalty, or they have to use up the Necromancer's Surge ability on them when he could be doing other spells. So just making them work for their meal, basically. The skeletons charge into my trolls there. The Necromancer chilling behind. And the Soul Reavers are both going to have a nibble on some trolls now, so both those troll units could die. And the king is now killed by the skeletons, so they're free. The mincer is wavered by Ilona, even though she only does one wound, so a very disappointing result for her there. There you can see, past that human hand, it was Ilona that did it. And look at that tape measure action. So one troll lord is down. Soul Reaver infantry move backwards, because they don't want to move away from that objective, you see. And the other troll lord down, and they turn to face in that direction where there's lots of my shooty goodness. And the trolls that are charged by the skeletons on the hill get wavered, so they're actually boxing in the bruiser as well because the skeletons can't move backwards because the necromancer is right up to them. The trolls can't move backwards because the bruiser is right up to them, and the bruiser can't see past the trolls at the moment because of where the centre of his unit is. So that's going to be mildly annoying now, although it does mean I can shoot at the skeletons if I'm not going to charge them. So I've got those two units of Soul Reavers in the middle who are... I'm glad they've not come towards my units as fast. The, particularly the unit right in the middle, I'm glad that they went backwards instead of going towards my Spitter Horde. Because they're going to get shot either way. And really, I think they should be just trying to kill my units at this stage. Turn five for me. So Rock Lobbers, what do we do here? 
Well, we kill off that skeleton horde that were on the hill successfully. And my trolls regenerate quite a few of their wounds there. So this flank is looking good. What do the water on bones get up to? We get those soul reavers up to nine damage, so that's a good start. And that's the turn, so not much happens really, because lots of waivers and lots of units shooting, but all focusing on just a couple of units really. So the two Soul Reaver infantry regiments are still alive, but they are vulnerable to all my shooting. Look how much is left alive. So uh, there are two trombones alive. Um, let me just go back a second. I thought Ilona attacked the trombone. Let me see here. I'm going to wind back because before Ilona fought that Mincer, I thought she attacked one of the trombones. Uh, because there are two trombones there. Did she attack something else? Let me see. Okay, because she's landed in the middle there. What was she fighting, though? Because that's confusing me now, because I'm sure there was the third trombone up there. So who did she attack when she jumped into the middle there? I know I'm winding back quite far here, but I want to make sure this is all correct. Okay, so it was a trombone that she attacked, and there was a trombone dying there. Let me just check here. I want to make sure that... Maybe I just haven't taken the dead trombone off the table yet. Okay, that one at the bottom there is dead. So let's just make sure I actually took it off the table and didn't accidentally carry on using it here. See, so there's one there. Still in the position where it was dead and placed after death. I think I might have made a mistake here and actually carried on using this dead war trombone, you know. So let's hope that doesn't make too much of a difference. Okay, let's keep going. So those skeletons are chilling on the wall there as we head into turn five because there's an objective right underneath them. So they'll be quite happy about that. And Ilona and... Okay, it's not going to make too much of a difference because they're going to... Both the trombones are about to die now anyway. And there's nothing else in range for the Soul Reavers to attack at this point. So thankfully it hasn't destroyed the game here. And over on that flank you can see the Necromancer is running away from the trolls. But he's actually put himself in a position where he can be charged by my trolls who could then overrun into the Skeleton Archers. Which would be quite amusing if that happened. So the Trombones are actually dead now. For reals this time, properly taken off the table. And they're now in a position to threaten my uh, rock lobbers. But you have to think at this point in the game, is it worth going after the rock lobbers? Because they are not going to score any points. And it's not that likely that they're going to hit each time. See, so he killed the same war machine twice. It looks that way. But based on the way he moved the units afterwards, I'm thinking it's pretty fortunate that it didn't ruin the game here. Because... What he probably would have done, he probably would have headed in this direction with the Soul Reavers anyway to go after my other units. So after he killed the trombone, he was then down here looking at the Rock Lovers. G or G says, what unit is the Rifleman? That is Skeleton Archers. So the fact that after combat, the Soul Reavers left themselves facing downwards in this direction suggests to me that he wants to make a beeline for my Rock Lovers, if anything. So I think they would have gone this way anyway and they are within charge range of that unit. So they wouldn't have been able to charge straight from the hill. So thankfully, I think that's gonna be all right there. Turn six for me. So what am I gonna try and do here? So I've got two shooter units on the left there that can both score. And then there's an objective right around the feet of my spitter regiment there. I'm gonna get the sniffs, hopefully within range of that as well. So I've got two units on it. And on the right, no one seems interested in coming after my Spitter Horde. Those Soul Reavers right in the middle of the table are just happy to sit on that objective and not come and get mine. 
So I'm quite pleased about that. They would be hindered going on the attack, but I think they could have got them if they'd started going that way earlier. Midnight Aristocrat says, is the big ball a lobber too? Yes, that is Grogger's great lobber. So turn six, the Archer Horde and the Rock Lobbers. They managed to kill off the skeleton archers and the trolls charge the necromancer, kill the necromancer and end up sitting on this objective. And that's where they came from. Over here, I've got lots of shooting. I've got sniffs, I've got uh, spitters. And you can see that all that combined with the blizzard from the wizard at the bottom there, and the lightning bolt from the wizard in the woods, all of that targets the soul reavers who were working their way towards my war machines. So they are now toast. And so there is two, there are two scoring units left, for my opponent's army, but both of them are currently on objectives. I've got my units on four objectives at the moment. So my opponent needs to do something juicy now. So turn six for the undead and there is a charge the soul reavers decide to abandon their objective because they're just going to lose if they stay there they decide to try and kill the trolls and take away one of my objectives while also having it themselves so they make a hindered charge on the trolls elona goes after the spitters and the skeletons are just trying to kill the mincer uh, the skeletons aren't going to move though because there's an objective right there so they would be foolish to do so Elona only does three damage to the spitters, so they're okay for now. The trolls are dead though, so I've lost one objective. My opponent still has the same number. And there's how it looks at the end of turn six. So if it ends there, I own three objectives, my opponent owns two. So if it ends right now, I am going to win. But we do get a turn seven, and I can exclusively reveal that in my turn seven, I only have 20 seconds left. Because of the vast amount of units I've got and all the positioning shenanigans I've been trying so 20 seconds left, what am I going to do with that time? I'm not going to have time to kill anything really, uh, because Elona's not even wounded, so there's no point even targeting her with anything. And I, the only thing I can do now, because the Soul Reavers, I believe with their boosted speed, they are currently in range to charge my right hand sniff unit. So what I would like to do is make sure that they cannot come over here and take this objective off me, because if they charged the sniffs and stole it off them, uh, the bruiser wouldn't be enough to contest that objective with them. So they would then deprive me of an objective and keep one for themselves. So I'm gonna move the sniffs towards them and just block them in there so that they can't come over here and attack the bruiser and take this one. Uh, so the sniffs are gonna sacrifice their lives just to keep the soul reavers on that objective. And anything else. There's nothing else I would really have time to do. I wouldn't have time to do any attacks. If I did have time, I would probably try to blizzard Ilona because she's the one who's in the threatening position at the moment. There's also Mortabris hanging out there, so I'd try to uh, blizzard one of them if I had time, or try and drop rocks on them, but with only 20 seconds I've only got time to shuffle one unit. So my turn, 20 seconds left. There we go, that's all I do. Just put the sniffs in front of the soul reavers so that they can't take the other objective off me. And this one is currently contested, so they would have to kill the sniffs to keep that objective as well. Raphael says, you should ask Mantic for some rules leaks for the third edition and make a video about it. Are you the biggest Kings of War channel? I would suggest that my channel has the most subscribers of any channel that primarily focuses on Kings of War. I think that is correct. If it's not, then someone let me know which one actually is the biggest in terms of subscribers. And you should also contact Mantic and tell them that you want to see lots and lots of pre-release third, edi third edition stuff on my channel. So they should just send me untold, untold amounts of pre-release items, such as the third edition rulebook and anything else that's being released. Tell them to just give me endless stuff for giveaways on my channel and all kinds of things. So just bombard Mantic with those kind of messages so that they can't deny the public demand. Would love to see some more Vanguard games on your channel. Well, I will be playing Vanguard at WAFCON this year, so there'll definitely be some more Vanguard content. And if that 
sparks my vanguard interest again, then you'll see more. Okay, so moving on to, we can see I've got two seconds left at the end of the game here, at the end of turn seven. So my opponent's turn seven. So let's look at this wide chart and see what my opponent needs to do here. Let's go back to this shot where you can see. So the Soul Reapers, all they're going to be able to do is kill the sniffs that I've parked in front of them. What else do they need to do to get anything out of this game? Because I'm currently holding three objectives, my opponent is holding two. So he needs to get me off another objective. What can accomplish that? Well, if he wants to clear me off the objective on the left, where I've got two units within range, he's going to have to kill the sniffs and the spitters in one go. The only way to accomplish that would be for Elona to kill one of them and for Mortabris to kill another with his lightning bolt spell. Uh, which it seems slim chance of that happening with the lightning bolt. But let's see. Rafael says, you do a great job with all these battle reports. I like to think so. I like to think that even though a lot of the other battle report channels, they have kind of more moving video content and more interpersonal banter, perhaps. I think mine are perhaps the most in-depth tactical analysis analyses that are out there. So moving on, what does my opponent do? Well, first of all, Mortabris jumps onto the hill and lightning bolts the sniffs, puts five, gets them up to five damage, should I say, so does two, meaning that he needed to roll nine to remove them, and successfully kills the spitters. So part one of the plan is successful. The mincer is just up against the skeletons, but look at this. Ilona charged into the sniffs, seven damage, needing to roll seven to remove them, but didn't manage it, only wavered them. So that is enough for me to win the game. Despite the fact that the sniffs over here were killed by the Soul Reavers, that means <clears throat> that at the end of the game, the Bruiser is holding an objective. See there, the Spitters are holding an objective and the sniffs, the wavered sniffs, are holding an objective and for the enemy, soul reavers holding an objective and skeletons have an objective under them. So it's 3-2 win for the goblins and there's how the battlefield looked at the end. Quite a lot of death. Uh, I think we killed a similar amount because I've got all my rock lobbers still alive and my wizards and my spitters and the Bruiser, and the Mincer, and the Sniffs, so there's a fair amount left. My opponent has very expensive units left, with Elona, Mortabris, and one of the Soul Reaver infantry regiments, and a Skeleton Horde. So, quite a lot of death, but we still had some expensive units left alive. So all in all, very happy with that win at the end there. Almost managed to turn it into a draw at the end, with that attempt to take out both my units in one go. Mortabris got slightly lucky to kill the spitters, but then Elona got slightly unlucky to fail to kill the sniffs, and my opponent had already used his once per game reroll on something else earlier. So, phew, very very close result there. So we end up with a win for me, and I took a picture of this army, because this is the one I voted for as the best painted army it's in fact I'm gonna have to move myself out of the way here so you can see this properly this is a trident realms army and obviously very very nice and colorful very very bright bold and particularly that big giant kraken looking squid monster which I think was representing an allied stampede from the herd and look at that very, very tasty indeed. Raymrig, I saw you there on Saturday, but you were deep in the zone, so I didn't interrupt. Well, I'm sure you could have popped over and said something. Even when I'm deep in my zone, I think I'm still... In fact, I'm not even going to... I'm not going to say I'm the most approachable wargamer, because then people actually start approaching me, and that would be terrible. But I think... You could have said hi, Mr. Graham Rigg, and I would have, I probably would have recognised you because I'm under the impression that you are just a giant beholder. So if I'd seen you, I'm sure I would have known. So very nice army there, which I took a picture of, even though I didn't get to play it. Very, very tasty indeed. Okay, by the way, it's not that terrible when people approach 
at events and such. Uh, when I was in America for Adepticon, I had quite a few people coming up to me and saying that they'd seen my channel or followed me on Twitter and so on. That was a few years ago from the Warhammer Fantasy community. I haven't been back to America recently, so I don't know if my Kings of War content has infiltrated their consciousness as much as my Warhammer Fantasy stuff had. Any one way to find out, though? I'll have to go there again at some point. Raphael says, also, you are very frequent with videos. I used to watch Mastercrafted and Hobby Source, but not much videos on these channels now. Yet yeah, a lot of the Kings of War Battle Report channels seems to have slowed down in their content lately. A lot pop up. You get tons of Battle Report channels appearing on a regular basis, but many of them don't last very long, or they move to different systems. And I think... I'm not sure if I have the most Kings of War Battle Reports on any channel, but I would like to think I'm definitely up there, since I do a report on every single game of Kings of War that I play, and I play it very regularly. I've been to 10 tournaments this season, I think, so that's since the last Clash of Kings, and I've reported on every single one. <clears> hey, <throat> okay. Rig, I was wearing an orange t-shirt with Gloom Dready on it. Well, had I spotted that, then I'm sure I would have suspected that it might have been you, but I did not spot such a t-shirt. So you should let us know in the chat what you were doing there at the event, Mr. Rig. Because it, at BritCon there are quite a lot of stands and uh, models for purchase, lots of different companies represented there, and many different tournaments going on at the same time. Spread all around the whole complex. So, moving on to the last game. Game 5, and I'm on table 2 at the moment. So I think I'm in 3rd place right now, but it's very close between 2nd and 3rd place in points. So, I'm in with a chance of winning the tournament. If I can get a big win here, and if on table 1, the player in 2nd place just gets a narrow win on the top table, or perhaps even a draw, could potentially give me the opportunity. Uh, because I've been picking up quite a lot of points in my wins uh, so far. So this is the kill scenario, and immediately, as soon as I hear that, I think, okay, that greatly benefits my army. Gun lines love kill. There's no reason to move anywhere, there's no objectives to go and chase after. Why go forward? Just sit here, come towards me, get shot to death. Sounds like a great idea to me. And up against another goblin army, though. And this goblin army is a very different build to mine. So let's go through the deployments. You can see on my left flank here, let's look at it from this angle so you can see what they're up against. We've got a little bit of impassable terrain there. So I'm trying to force the enemy into that little choke point between the hill and the terrain where I've got lots of shooting looking at them. I've got spitters, I've got sniffs, I've got the king, I've got two lobbers that can all see down that lane there. Then moving towards the combat chunk of the army, I've got a bruiser, I've got a wizard, I've got trolls, two lots of trolls there mostly behind that hill, and then I've got the three trombones behind and the flagget. So just that wall of flaming death for anyone that gets through, as usual. We've got the mincer chilling out on a wall, we've got the goons, we've got the blizzard wizard with two more rocks there. And over on that side we've got a little bit of a shooty element and some trolls. So what does my opponent have here? Apart from a human hand, there is some fleabag cavalry. There is Kuzlo and Madfall. Dicey Guy says, Battle reports are hard to make. Feel this format Andy makes are great. Yes, these are very actually very easy to do for me. Some people have said they struggle to do battle reports like this because they don't have a very good memory. So you do have to be able to remember details of games so that you have some kind of context for all the pictures that you've taken. Especially a two-day event, sometimes not even reporting on it the day after. Uh, so some people are more comfortable doing the video as it goes along, but I find that just... It's soul-crushing the amount of time it takes to edit those. So there are some chariots there. There's a chariot regiment. So quite a fast little wing of the army there, but there is a hill between. So the chariots can see over it, but the other units cannot. There is a lava pool, and the special effect for this table is that it makes you, it gives you hindered movement, that lava pool, if you're close to it. So, okay. And I think it also gives you stealthy as well. Is that right? Is that correct? I don't remember exactly. I think maybe it does though. 
So there is a bit of an incentive to stay near it. So it might give you stealthy or cover or something, but it also gives you hindered movement, something like that. Then there is a bigot behind that horde of spitters there in the woods. To the left of them is a mincer. Then there is a horde of uh, sharp, I think they're a horde of rubble actually, and a legion of sharp sticks with a bigot between them and another mincer on the left there. Then there is a regular giant, unlike the colossal giant that we saw here, with a water on bone in front of it, I don't know if I mentioned that. And there is a king on chariot to the left of the giant there. There is a troll bruiser, a regiment of trolls, a horde of trolls, and another flea bag cavalry unit there. So a lot more combat than I've got. Uh, more hard hitting when it comes to fighting, but much, much less shooting. So we'll see if that works in my favour in the kill scenario. I suspect it will. I think my opponent's perhaps got very unfortunate with the army he's come up against here in the final round on kill. The reason I don't really like kill scenario is it just doesn't encourage you to move. So if you can outshoot your opponent, just sit there and just kill them, essentially. So uh, my opponent elects to go first to get a bit of movement going and to maybe get in the first strike, which I'm not too disappointed about. Because there are things preventing any kind of alpha strike, if you will, here. There's not much shooting on my opponent's side. But you can see that he immediately turns those flea bags around and starts heading in another direction, as if it was a ploy positioning them in the first place over here to make me deploy more units on this side and then whisking them away again afterwards. So we'll see if that works out. And the chariots there are going to be able to shoot. Over here, you can see that the horde of rabble have moved up with a mincer for company, with a bigot right behind them. And then everything pushes up as well behind them. The trolls are moving up. They were positioned so that they wouldn't have to slow down too much for the terrain, which is obviously wise. And the cavalry behind them. For the chariots, they plink a bit of damage with their bows onto my spitters, who are in cover at the moment, so that's fine. And some more shots from the spitters onto Grogger's goons. So two damage there. And the king on chariot, what does he do? One damage onto my left flank, which is the spitter regiment. So the enemy is quite far away and not really within charge range with anything at this point. So there's no incentive for me to move too much forwards. The only thing I really want to throw out there is the mincer and try and encourage the enemy to go for the mincer, basically. And then I can counter charge on the back of that. So if I'm going to get in combat, I want it to be on my terms. Otherwise, I'm just going to shoot everything. And this hill on my left side here is going to provide great cover because some of the hard-hitting units, the trolls and the bruiser, all the trolls and the bruiser and the cavalry there, are not going to be able to see over that hill. So if I can do most of my fighting to the right of the hill, I can try and avoid their fury for a bit. Turn one for me. So not much movement down this side, not much movement at all, in fact, but lots of shooting. So what do I... Managed to kill or maim with this gun battery here. We kill off the troll regiment immediately. So the screen has gone. In the middle, just the mincer has been thrown up there in charge range of something to try and tempt them into a charge on old Mincy. And the rock lobbers here with a laser next to them. And the spitters. They managed to kill off the chariots the chariot regiment immediately as well. So a good rock hit and some bow shots take that down immediately. So it's really just Kuzlo up against my right flank now, unless those flea bags want to turn around again. And what does Mr. Blizzard do? Well, he kills a war trombone. So again, with that blizzard, it's just anything that you can kill in one go. You think, that's going to be annoying later in the game. Just whoosh, down it goes, it's dead. Move on to something else. So war tromboned out, and my opponent only has two trombones to begin with. So potentially very dangerous. Obviously I know what they can do since I've so many of them myself, so I know that it's important to kill them. And it's important to kill them early, because if you're wasting your time killing them at the end of a game, that means you're not killing units in most scenarios that can be scoring points. So if you can get rid of trombones early, it's very helpful. So turn two for my opponent, and Kuzlo has just pushed himself to the flank of the trolls, out of their charge arc. Uh, so he's really just in distraction mode at the moment, trying to tie up lots of my units on his own. 
the horde of rabble do charge into the mincer. So let's see if they can do anything to it. And the fleabags and the trolls and the bruiser move up to the left of the hill, which again is pretty much what I wanted to keep out of their threat area and do most of my fighting in the middle where they can't see me. You can see the giant and a couple of mincers are poised to strike anyone that attacks that horde though. So you'll see what I do about that. The spitter horde and the bigot. Some more damage onto the goons. The rabble do nothing to the mincer. So what am I going to charge into that horde? I can tell you right now it's going to be a lot of units. I think I charge, I think I make a quadruple charge into there. So I'm going to send in both troll hordes on the left here. I'm going to send in Grogger's goons as well and the mincer counter charging. So the trolls on the right aren't going in. I'm keeping them back because I'm very concerned about that colossal giant and I don't want to accidentally get them charged by it. So I'm going to throw a lot into that rabble horde, keeping it all off the hill. So it's preventing me from being charged by a lot of units. And then I'm going to push up my trombones and use all my shooting to try and take out any units that are threatening whatever I've got there. And then I'm going to pull back after killing the unit, hopefully, and minimize which units can actually charge me afterwards. So turn to what does the little shooting barrage accomplish this time? We've got the sniffs, we've got the spitters, we've got the king, we've got some lobbers. Well, they waver the flea bags. So those trolls are pinned in there now, unless the flea bags want to move out of the way, which I'm not sure they do because they're just opening the trolls up to being shot. So it's a tricky situation for them now. The trombones move up and they have a go at tromboning the king, uh, but they don't do too much damage actually. Very disappointing there. But that quadruple charge I was telling you about, it, that pays off nicely. And the three units at the bottom, they pull back a bit to minimize who can charge them. And the one troll unit just turns around because they were charging into the flank. So they turn to face the enemy and prepare to possibly be killed. But that's an acceptable outcome. And the mincer has pulled back and the giant will be unable to charge that. So the sniffs over on the right flank. Are, they're putting themselves in the woods so they can shoot out of it. And the trolls are just staying out of Kuzlo's charge out there. And also getting off the hill so that the flea bags back there can't charge them. So I, I'm just using the trolls to tie up both those units now. And my units are still very useful here because they can still shoot. So it's just the trolls trading their value for Kuzlo and a cavalry regiment at the moment. I'm just turning it into a stalemate between those three units, which is okay with me. Kuzlo can, of course, break that. He's nimble. He can get out of the position and threaten somebody else. But I've got Sniffs who can turn around and deal with him, hopefully, without any hindrance. So they may be able to do some damage to him. And I've got everyone with their bows trained on the Colossal Giant at the moment. That's how it's looking at this end. And all the way down here. So, turn three. For my opponent. So Kuzlo does what I suspected and puts himself threatening all my unit's flanks. And the flea bags are not on the hill, so I can't charge them at the moment with my trolls. And we have a double giant charge, colossal and mini giant, into Grogger's goons. Let's see what they can do there. We've got a mincer and the legion charging into the troll horde that were too far forward. And the king on chariot has charged into the other trolls. So, giving my opponent the opportunity to charge but still essentially on my terms, hopefully, and lots of these units are damaged. So if they do break through, look at that wall of trombones there. So on the other side, uh, the enemy trombone is positioned, I think behind the hill, it couldn't quite get onto the hill, if I'm doing correctly, and the trolls are still penned in there behind the flea bags. So the spitter horde of my enemy put one damage onto the trolls that didn't get involved in the fighting, and the giants combine to only do 9 damage to the goons, so can't remove them. The king on chariot plinks a little bit with his close combat attacks onto those trolls, but he's really just there to pen them in a bit. And you can see that the mincer has a flank charge on that giant now, which is going to be nice. And the troll horde are killed there. They were the ones that went into the flank of the enemy horde. But I've got the enemy... Uh, kind of right where I want them. I didn't want to be fighting them all at once, so 
inviting those units into the centre has prevented the ones on the left of the hill from being involved in the fight, which is a fight I would definitely lose if it was just close combat between everything at once. So uh, you may think, why push anything forward at all and invite the enemy into combat, and then why throw everything into that horde so they can countercharge you, but I just want to be fighting sections of the enemy army at once rather than letting it all get into charge range at the same time. Because even though I've got lots of shooting, I do have to focus fire it on certain things. I can't just plink little bits onto everything and expect to accomplish much. So, it's taking place mostly in my half, which is fine. And I'm now going to deliver some glorious counter charges. My turn three. So, the Sniffs have turned around to face Kuzlo, and the Trolls have stayed out of his charge arc, and the Trolls are accepting they're going to be charged by the flea bags on the hill if I can't waver them or kill them with my shooting. Rock lobs. They do waver the flea bags though. I do get enough hits on them, and the trolls are now safe. The giants take a double charge. The colossal giant takes a double from the groggers and the trolls, and takes a fair bit of damage. And the giant that gets flanked by the mincer doesn't take that much damage actually. That's a bit disappointing. Then we've got the water on bone, and all this shooting here. What does it do? kills off that cavalry unit, and the trolls, because they were stuck behind them, are not in range to charge anyone yet, so they weren't a threat, so I didn't target them as much. I only started shooting them once I already had the uh, the unit of cavalry at virtually double one area, that's when I started targeting the trolls. And I will be right back in a moment. Okay, and we are back. So, you can see that those trolls have started to take a bit of damage, but again, they weren't a priority this turn. And you can see in the middle there that the king on chariot was killed off. I think that was by shooting as well. And the legion attacked them with, the, with a horde of trolls, and they've taken quite a lot of damage. Look at that. A very good performance from the trolls there, so that puts them in the area where I can finish them off now. Because prior to that, uh, if you if you're attacking something with such high nerve and you're only putting a few damage on them, they're not really in the danger zone. But once you start something that's got nerve upwards of twenty five or more, then any time you get them above like ten damage, suddenly they're they're looking very very vulnerable to attack next turn. And also, my trolls here, before I made this charge, we established that they would not be on the hill afterwards. We made, we checked the curvature of the hill and everything to make sure that 50% were going to be off the hill. It's hard to tell from this angle because they're kind of sloped because they're hanging off the hill now. But we established that they were off the hill before I decided to do the charge. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it because I wouldn't want to be charged by that bruiser as, as well as everything else there. So they're not on the hill. So they're safe from attack from all those units out on the left. And it's looking very healthy at the moment. It's not quite a mopping up exercise yet, but it's still looking good. Turn four for my opponent. So Kuzlo attacks the Sniffs, who are protecting the flank of the Spitters. And I'm quite happy for this attack to take place. I don't think he'll kill them in one round. And the flea bags there just pivot a bit. There's not much they can do since they're wavered. And I believe, in fact, let me go back. Okay, that's right, it wasn't the bruiser, because the bruiser could see them, because he can see them over the top of the, the, the sharp stick legion. But you can see at the top left there, the other trolls are the ones I was avoiding. So they would have had a flank charge on the trolls had they been clusters on the hill which obviously I wouldn't like to happen. And I think there was just space for them to fit with the how far the trombones had moved there. And they definitely would have been able to fit if the legion had moved out the way. 
So I didn't want there to be a chance of that, so that's what I was avoiding. So the bruiser is able to charge them, but he was only in the front. So yeah, that's correct. So double charge there. So they might die. We'll see. But they've done a good job. The giants double charge Grogger's goons to try and finish them off. And the bigot goes into the flank of the mincer, which is never a bad idea. The other bigot boxes in those trolls a bit. But if you look at the positioning of the colossal giant, he's also presented me with the opportunity to counter charge on this bigot, kill it, and overrun into the colossal giant. So, potentially risky there. What does the spitter horde accomplish? Shooting at my spitter horde, who are in cover, so not much. Puzzlow does a couple of damage, but not enough to worry. Sniffs there. No damage on the mincer, which is nice because it'll keep its thunderous charge. No damage on those trolls either. But Grogger's goons do get killed. But the giants are a little bit penned in there, so let's see where they end up. So that looks like a fairly simple overrun for the trolls now. The other giant has turned to face the mincer. And I really want to charge that colossal giant with an overrun. So that's what I'm going to go for, even though I think, I think I've, I don't think actually that I can see the, the rear of that little giant. I think it's just out of the arc. So you can see there from above. And the double charge on that troll horde from the legion, who are heavily wounded and the bruiser, does kill them. But that legion should be primed to be finished off by anything now. They only need a few more damage on them. So there's some human hand action going on there. So, uh, the trolls charged at one of the trombones on the hill, actually, because they didn't have any other options, so they killed it. And hopefully the trombone actually makes it all the way off the table this time. And it's still looking fairly healthy, but I have lost a couple of big units there. Turn four. And the trolls do exactly what I said. They overran the bigot after killing him and then finished off the colossal giant. And because... It was an overrun, I was able to shoot the Colossal Giant first with various attacks. So that bigot being there didn't pay off in the end. It actually made it worse for the Colossal Giant, if anything. Uh, the small giant survives the Mincer's attack, though. The Mincer's been a bit disappointing with its attack rolls in this game. The Trolls have been good, though. And the Troll Bruiser that I've got at the bottom there charges in and finishes off that Legion. So, very nice. Then all this... Killer shooting up here finishes off that troll horde that came in to attack the war trombone. I mean, look at that, that's just a little battery of death. I've got lightning bolt, I've got lobbers, I've got so many bow shots, including the king, and they just can't stand up to it, and down they go. I think the trombone on the hill might actually target the bruiser, and that's why he's damaged as well. And the sniffs. Uh, they managed to waver Kuzlo and Madfall on the counter charge there. That's nice, and the trolls kill off the Flea bags that were on that right hand hill, and they've now turned to face Kuzlo so they can mop up this flank in a minute. And it's looking very healthy now, there's very few enemy units left, and I've got a lot left. There's the giant, there's a bigot in the middle, right in the middle of the picture, there's the troll bruiser on the left, there's the spitter horde at the top, and there's Kuzlo who is wavered. And that is it. Everything else that you can see is actually dead at the top of the screen. So, turn five. Kuzlo just tries to get out of harm's way, but we established he couldn't quite make it out of range of the trolls, despite his best efforts to nimbly move out the way. The troll bruiser decides to have a go at the war trombone, and I was pretty pleased with this because it puts in a him in a position where I've got options. I can either shoot him with a zillion attacks, or I can charge him in multiple facings with lots of units, because I've got two sniff regiments and the bruiser down there. So I'll be able to triple charge him at least, if I feel like doing that. And if not, I can always shoot him with everything now that he's on the hill. So, Spitter Horde. Onto my Spitter Horde. Again, just a little bit of damage. They're both in cover, so they wouldn't be able to do too much to each other. You think the Giant does kill the Mincer, though. Uh, so he's turned round to threaten my Trolls, who are heading towards his Archers. And a bigot into the bruiser doesn't do anything. But this bruiser, the enemy bruiser, does kill the trombone, as you'd expect. And there's how it's looking. So, still very healthy. And I think it's the one unit of sniffs and the king I'd be able to charge into that bruiser along with my bruiser. 
and then I would have the option to shoot him with a trombone, a lightning bolt, lots of attacks, if I deem that that's better. Turn five for me. So I do go for the triple charge in the end. He was already wounded. I've got a bruiser. I've got a king who are decent at fighting. And the sniffs weren't even charging him in the front. So they didn't need yellow bellied. Uh, so they were getting lots of attacks as well. So all that combined killed him, which freed up from my shooting, such as the war trombone, which I was then able to use on the bigot that was there, who is now dead. Result. My rock lobbers killed off the giant. And I positioned that flag it in front of the giant to stop him rearcharging my trolls next turn just in case he survived but he did not he died from the mass shooting barrage trolls wave a kuzlo so he's going to survive another round so that charge and my trolls charge hindered into the spitters in the woods and put some damage on them and that's how it looks at the end of that turn so two enemy units left one of them's wavered so this is looking very, very one-sided at the moment, as I suspected it might, based on the scenario and the two lists. Raphael is talking in rather nostalgic terms about the, the goblin legion there. Yep, lots of people still have those old plastic goblins. I used to have a ton of those. I don't anymore, though. Turn six for the enemy goblins. So... Kuzlo can't do much apart from regenerate some wounds and try and get out of the way a bit but it's not going to help him too much and the spitters back away so anyone who charges them next turn will have to be hindered I'm still confident and what I'm going to be able to do I'm going to be able to charge the king from the bottom left into those spitters the trolls directly in front of them and also the sniffs on the right of the screen they're going to be able to charge the flank of that unit as well so and then the trolls will hopefully finish off Kuzlo. Uh, I don't think I have that much time left on the clock at this point though. So turn six, the trolls finish off Kuzlo. I decide not to charge him with the spitters as well because I think the clock was getting a bit low. And all the other units that I mentioned, the king, the sniffs and the trolls, they finish off the spitter horde there. And that is every opposing unit dead. So that's the end of the game. Don't even need to roll for turn seven. So very, very one-sided there. I have to feel bad for someone when it comes up with the kill scenario. I'm not really a fan of that scenario at all. I can understand why it's put in there as the final game on a two-day event, because people are tired and it's not that much positioning to think about, really. But it really does favour gun lines, if you ask me, because all the other scenarios encourage you to move, which mitigates the overpowered nature of certain shooting units in the game I think but when it's just kill and you can literally sit there and just gun the enemy down and you don't even have to move uh, the enemy were forced to come towards me and it's, with my list it's kind of a, a death trap because if you stay back you get shot to bits you stay at medium range and try and stay out of charge range of my units then mostly it's also out of your charge range, unless you have a really fast list, especially this particular enemy list. It was only the cavalry that were faster than my trolls, for example. And the chariots, they were killed instantly. Cavalry were getting wavered left and right and then killed. So, and if you go into the, your own charge range, you're then in charge range of my trolls and the troll bruiser. And it's just not a good time getting eaten by that. The giants are fairly fast, but one of them was staying near the hindered movement lava area to be to try and get some stealth so he didn't get rock lobbed off the table instantly and uh, the giants did okay i suppose but in the end they got munched the small giants actually survived quite a lot attacks from the mincer but as a result of that i was on table two and a massive win so if table one went really well for me then maybe i could have won the tournament but i did hear word passed down that somebody had won all five of their games so it was very very unlikely unless they had really narrow wins all the way through that I would have a chance at winning overall considering I lost my first game so it's very very likely that I was heading for second place based on the result and that is exactly what happened so there is the second place trophy nice kings of war second place glass with BHGS on the back which I think is British Historical Gaming Society I think those are the people that put on the 
event that the Kings of War tournament was part of. Most of the stuff there was historicals. I think Kings of War is the only real uh, fantasy thing that was represented there in terms of the gaming side of it. I think some of the manufacturers there or retailers had some uh, non-historical stuff, but not a whole lot, if I remember correctly. I think it's mainly a, a historical type event. And there it is added to the trophy collection. So it's taller than all my other glass trophies there. And it's gone right in the middle next to my very stylish and swirly first place trophy from Ultibash. So adding to my second place collection, if we go across all game systems, how many second place awards do I have now? Let's see. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, I think. I think that's correct. Six second place trophies. And that seems to be a theme. I collect a lot of second place awards. And uh, in this particular tournament, I think losing game one was maybe a good thing in the end because I was able to kind of submarine my way up and I never had to play the overall winner of the event who had a list that I think was very, very tough for gun lines. It was very, very fast and uh, there was a vanguarding flying individual, I think, who could have landed behind my lines, which may not have been wise actually against my list because of all my breath attacks and shooting that can just turn on the spot and gun you down and blizzard and so on. Uh, so I would have liked to have tested myself against the list, the winning list, but unfortunately there isn't one more round in the event, which would have meant I would have been matched up with the first player in the next round. So I would have liked to have faced that, hopefully at some point in the future, to see. But I'm not sure I'm going to run a goblin list like this again, because at 2,600 points you can really take a really powerful, ridiculous gun line like I did with 15 shooting units, but also have enough combat punch with all the trolls and the mincer and the goons to actually absorb and fight back in a really threatening manner when someone comes to within range. At 2,000 points, I always struggled to find the balance. When I took one of my mega gun lines at 2,000 points, I felt a little bit short on combat units. So when the enemy does get into range, uh, there's not that much to fight back with. And if you go half and half with the gun line, then uh, sometimes you end up undecided on whether you should be trying to push forward and get into combat or whether you should hold back and shoot. So you have to, you need a balance, but you need enough units of each type to be able to pull it off, I think. And it's a lot more difficult for me at 2,000 points with the units I like running. Okay, so this obviously worked out very well. And I'm liking the alternative point level events, obviously. Ulti Bash, the one I won, was at a very low point level. This one, I've managed to finish second, and this is a very high point level. The Clash at Kingston, which was recent as well, that was varied point level, starting tiny, getting huge at the end. So I'm liking this variety in the community, keeping things spiced up. I'm sure once we get into third edition, it'll settle down again into a mostly around 2,000 points again. And then as time goes on, people add more spice to it. But it'll be interesting to see exactly what happens in 3rd edition, uh, whether they change the restrictions on units at certain point levels as well. That'll be interesting to see. Hopefully they don't limit the number of trolls, because I've got a ton of them. And that is everything from the event. So I'm going to disappear from the screen, and I'll just give you a few final thoughts on my list, if I can think of anything. And drop in any last minute comments or questions, and I will refer to those in a moment as I go. Steve says he would prefer Dominate or Invade for the last game at a tournament. I would agree with that, because it's there's still uh, not that much thinking. Uh, thinking is a bit of a harsh way of putting it, but there's not as much to consider compared to all the <clears throat> objective-grabbing scenarios and all the more complicated ones. Invade and Dominate are just very, very simple. Here's an area of the table. Get your army in it. That's nice and simple. It doesn't... Re tax your brain too much to get your head around what you need to accomplish there and I think that's the, a good way to end an event I remember a lot of events have ended with dominate in the past if I'm remembering rightly and I would approve of that I don't think kill should ever be in a tournament personally uh, even though I have seen it come up in several now as the final round and I do understand why it's there but I disapprove and if I was running in a tournament and hopefully one day I will run one 
then Hill would not be found in there at all, I can guarantee it. Uh, anything else? So my list, I think very, very solid, as I've been saying. Really powerful gun line with enough combat punch as well. Uh, obviously the only game I lost was against an even more ridiculous gun line than mine, which had way more long-range war machines than I did. And even then, I think I was unlucky in that game as well at the end. I think that could have easily been a draw, or if I had a look slightly earlier, Grogger's goons were killed with a very high roll, so if they'd lived, then it could have even turned into a win. And then there was the game against the undead that could definitely have been a draw. My opponent, he got very, very unfortunate not to kill that final unit with Ilona, but again was mildly fortunate to kill the sniffs with the lightning bolt. And then, yeah, so that definitely could have ended in a draw. So overall, I would say the luck uh, pretty much evened out throughout the day. The Rock Lobbers, they did all right. I think they did pretty much average throughout the whole tournament. They would usually have a couple of turns where they hit nothing, and then a couple of turns where two or three of them would hit at once. So it averaged out in the end. And the first couple of games, there were a lot of times I was rolling for the Rock Lobbers, hitting, and then I would roll one for the number of wounds. So they would barely do any damage each time. But they did pick up towards the end of some of the games and start dealing some devastating hits. Like if you recall in the Abyssal Dwarf game, the Obsidian Golems that double wand Grogger's Goons, which was a very nice touch, then those Golems got taken out by Flying Rocks. So a little bit of good fortune uh, coming my way on that one. And overall it was a very enjoyable experience. There were, I think there were five, five or six Spanish players that came over and I played against three of them out of my five games. All my games were good. I think you'll agree that they were all interesting, at least, until maybe the final game that was a little bit one-sided because of the scenario. So you have to take pity on my fellow goblin player there at the end, just for that. But all the other games I thought were pretty damn close. And overall, very, very juicy experience at the tournament. And I don't mean that because people were sweaty in there, even though day two was quite hot. Uh, there wasn't an excess amount of sweat, which you would often associate with events in a packed building like that. So, time to wrap this one up, I think. So, I don't forget to check out all the links. Oh, Steve says, what are you taking to WAFCON? Probably going for Plague, Zazor, and Northern Alliance. Well, WAFCON, I'm taking Plague for Dead Zone, uh, because I alternate between taking Plague and Rebs, and took Rebs to the last event, so it's going to be Plague this time. And I may go for something similar to the kind of list that I won a tournament with last year. Uh, so we'll see about that. I need to check out the Escalation book as well, just to make sure that that's still a really viable thing to run. Uh, for Dreadball, I'm thinking about trying out yet another team because I don't want to take the Z's again because I've already won a tournament with them, finished second with them, have a 100% competitive win rate with them, so what is there left to prove with the Z's really? Uh, the Phase Dudes, they did okay at times at the last tournament, but I'm thinking I, I could try out one of my other teams that I've already got painted. I've got the four original teams, which are the Humans, the Forge Fathers, the Orcs, and the Rat Dudes. So um, I might go for the Orcs, because they seem to be quite popular at the moment. So I need to give them a try in a couple of games and see how they do, because I've had them painted for years. They were one of the first teams I ever did. So I'll give them a go. And Vanguard, I've still only really got the Goblins, because I haven't really thrown myself fully into Vanguard yet. I need something to spark my enjoyment of that. I need maybe a couple of people around here to be really into it and wanting to play games regularly. Uh, before that really grabs me big time. So I think I'm just going to go similar to what I took to the last Vanguard event uh, with the models I have available. Probably a troll and some mounted goblin characters, something like that. We'll see that. I'm doing both days of WAFCON though, so three tournaments in one, so everyone can look forward to seeing those three juicy reports afterwards. Hopefully they're sizzling and tender and succulent, much like the Kings of War content. And it'll be nice to add big chunk of variety there. So that will be coming in a few weeks, I think. It's only a few weeks away. So you can look forward to that. 
Don't forget to check out the links in the description, everybody. The various social media going on down there, Twitter, Facebook group, if you want to keep up with all the things I'm doing. And, of course, the fundraising links as well. In particular, Patreon, if you want to send me vast sums of money so that I can continue to justify spending large amounts of time creating all this wonderful, insightful, tactical content for you. Then, of course, that's very much appreciated, the people that are already on there. And with that, all that remains to be said at this stage, I think, is... Good night out there. Whatever you are.